Welcome back to the Pod of Greed. That's right. This is episode 47, I want to say. If you can believe it, we're actually close to a year. That is weird. Yeah, it doesn't feel like... I feel like we didn't even start this like that long ago. It feels too new. And somehow we're still doing it. I thought we'd drop off after like month three. Yeah, this is the most consistent thing we've done this year. It's the most consistent thing I've done in my life. So, uh, welcome back. Happy Thursday. For those of you guys tuning in to the live premiere, ones in chat. Put your um, eyes up. Yeah, so this is going to be a pretty interesting week because we've got a lot of stories. They, they, but I think they're really disparate. Yeah, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of stories. Um, one of the more Yu-Gi-Oh light weeks, I think. Although that might not be the. It depends on like if we start we're ranting. I mean, yeah, you happens. saw how the last pod went. <laughs> yeah. Um. So two quick announcements just before we get into the meat and potatoes of things. The first one is that we are doing a whatnot live auction this Friday. That's this Friday, March 29th mm-hmm. at 12 p.m. Central Time. That's like 10 a.m. Pacific, I want to say. And I'm bad with time zones. 1 p.m. Eastern. Either way, we're going to be um, selling a bunch of really cool Yu-Gi-Oh accessories, mostly some play mats, some cool deck boxes, a few other things that I found. There's even some giveaways. Yeah, we're going to have a giveaway of a plush rescue rabbit, which I should have actually had out on the table for you guys to see, but it's okay. It's anyway, here. Just trust yeah, us. Yeah, we did a whatnot stream a couple weeks back. It was really mm. fun. So this is going to be our second one. We'll have the information linked down in the description of this podcast. Make sure you tune into that. should be cool. The second announcement is that there is um, our first Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel Challenger Cup. Oh, yeah. That's going to be this Sunday, mm-hmm. March 31st. And you can sign up to that via the Challenger Cup Discord server. This is run by Konami. It's a Konami-sponsored thing. This but is an official Master Duel tournament, not those unofficial things y'all been doing. Yeah, and so uh, we'll be live streaming it over on the Team APS channel. I'll be doing commentary of all the cool feature matches. And there are some really neat prizes that people Actual can win. prizes, y'all. Yeah, there's like, you know, Master Duel sleeves, hoodies, jackets, and... Um, plush rescue rabbits as well. I know they're quite valuable. And you can get the shirt off Paul's back. Not that one. You'll get a, a clean, fresh one from Konami. But also, um, they are going to be doing these all month, or like all, you know, the rest of this month and next month. So mm-hmm. even if you missed this one, because it's capped at 256 players, there will be others. I think I've got one on April 5th and also April 6th so far. And there's other content creators involved with this too. So. That's true. There are other content creators who are also doing them. Fifth Ray Duelist, Shiggy's, Dada Doya, uh, maybe one more I'm forgetting. North but America's yeah. finally in the game. Yeah, so they're doing Master Duel Cups. It's just a, a tournament. Master Duel wins some prizes. Check it out. Uh... Okay, I think that's all for announcements. Yeah, sounds about right to me. So let's yeah. dig into Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. Oh, wait. Also, we have a review. Oh, we yeah. You have a review. Yeah. Let me know, by the way, guys, if you like the reviews, like being at the beginning or maybe the end of the podcast, if there's like a preference people have. I'm just always worried we'll forget if we put them at the end. Yeah, we'd have to like make it a bit of a routine. Glad you guys are here. This is from Downtown Andy. Hey, guys, still my favorite podcasts. So many things I want to say about the most recent episode, but I just want you to know my six-year-old wants to play and especially watch the DM anime more than I do. This game was a great way for me to teach uh, his older brother and now him math way beyond what he's learning in school, and that brings me a lot of joy. You yeah. remember last week we were talking about how like a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s future is going to rely on um, probably millennials yeah. choosing to teach their kids Yu-Gi-Oh!, whether that's on their own or if there's like some sort of a, you know, a campaign by Konami to do so. You know, my mom's a school teacher and um, she's all she was always happy that by playing Yu-Gi-Oh and other card games that we were using our math. I mean, it, it wasn't any type of crazy math. Right. But we were still like practicing and learning. And honestly, she's still a school teacher now. and She just wishes her kids would play more card games. I think what's cool about the way Yu-Gi-Oh can work for like young people if you're like learning school stuff is it's like kind of more applied math and applied reading. Mm-hmm. So obviously like you can just be arbitrarily given like a math equation on a sheet of paper, but Yu-Gi-Oh kind of puts it into context and I think that's very important for like appreciating like what math is for and not just like Johnny bought 500 watermelons and like 300 bust, you know, it's not... It would be kind of fun. A Yu-Gi-Oh! kind of a math exam where it's like, if Blue-Eyes White Dragon attacks 
a Celtic Guardian in attack position, how much damage is dealt? Yeah, to then the you player. add a bunch of things like for, the Forbidden Droplets got chained, and then so and so chained this, and this is like decreasing. But, but I mean, what if Celtic Guardian was in defense position? How much damage is done? People would probably get that wrong. I know, you know it's a trick funny question. Is it sounds like that's like the judge exam, basically. If anyone's done like the judge sort of certification, never done it. It's there are like some sort of damage step, you know, calculation related things. So yeah, but that is good to hear. I think that it's interesting to hear that someone who's so young would want to watch the DM anime. Not would they want to watch it? That's sorry. That the anime is fine. It's more like I'm surprised that they are. I suppose like this person is. Putting it in front of them, the, like exposing them to well, the Well, it sounds anime. like they, the, uh, Andy, right? This is downtown mm-hmm. Andy. I think it sounds like Andy kind of put it in front of his kids. And, I mean, they're still kids. They'll, if you present them, well, young enough, of course, if you present them with, like, something to entertain them, you know, they'll just take to it. Yeah. So. I, think that, I think really the issue with, like, kids not playing as many card games and not playing Yu-Gi-Oh! is that, their parents are not putting it in front of them. Yeah, that's why I think they got to reboot that old anime and just kind of like just reboot it or remaster it and kind of try to put Throw it, it on, on Netflix. Th- and, and like put it on some TV channels, whatever it takes to kind of like expose more people to it. I don't know. Channels mm-hmm. only want to run Paw Patrol. I don't know. And yeah, they only run Paw Patrol. What What is the one that uh, Cartoon Network always runs? Teen uh, Titans Go. Teen Titans Go. Nickelodeon only runs SpongeBob, but that's for different reasons now. It's a, it is insane that like SpongeBob has lasted as long as it has. Jeez. It's like the only uh, Nickelodeon show that's safe that they can probably run right now. <clears throat> Quiet given, on set. Given, uh, <laughs> given the recent things. But, um, okay, anywho. Yeah, thank you for the review. We appreciate it. As always, you guys, if you like the podcast, can leave a positive review on your listening platform of choice or here on YouTube. We will take reviews in the form of thumbs ups or super chats or whatever you want to yeah. give. And, you know, Paul Paul's going to read the ones that most flatter him. So, right. What's the Yu-Gi-Oh news this week? Uh, so at least on my end, I don't have too much as far as, uh, news stories as far. Yeah. I really thought we were getting a ban list this week. Like I think you TCG. and the rest of the community did. Yeah. I really thought so. Um, I'm I thought we were getting one last week to be honest. Yeah. I'm a little disappointed that we aren't like, it just seems like it's kind of, um, people have been asking for it. I guess we're just in that ban list fever. Mm-hmm. It happens like kind of tired of a format. You feel like it's. It's gone on a bit long, even though I guess it hasn't gone on like that long. But, but be, given the type of format it is, people would rather see it move sooner rather than later. Yeah. But, you know, Konami's not going to drop this list until multiple factors line up, and we don't get to know what those factors yeah. are. I mean, for all, literally, it's funny because, like, this is going to be premiering, you know, like, on Thursday morning, and it could be, like... There'd be some irony in the sense that, like, right when this podcast ends, its premiere, it could, like, drop then. Like, you just never know with yeah. Konami. Heck, I mean, it's uh, it's around 2 p.m. for us right now. It could drop around 3. It could drop while it we're could recording. mid recording. I will double check, by the way, throughout this podcast. <laughs> if, like, I'll just check Twitter <laughs> and see. Like, oh, the band list happened. Unexpected story here. But um, you'll, be you'll get character. our real ra- live reactions. You'll be in character like the uh, Bandless Fever uh, skit where we had you refreshing the page. Yeah. Oh, we got to get back to doing skits. That's what we got to do. It's Give us ideas for skits, listeners. We will do that. Okay. Um. Yeah, so no ban list. Yeah. No. So no huge news. Um. Uh, Snake Eyes are still terrorizing the format as two of the best decks of the format. Well, the Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel Duelist Cup. Uh, did end. Oh, yeah. Um, Ryan Yu, I saw, did really well in it. I saw Pac did really well in it. I think Ryan Yu got first place in North America, which is really cool. He's the sort of top player most known for playing the Labyrinth deck. He's I done remember well we at, saw him at Worlds. Yeah, he's done well at YCS events with it. He's done well in the Duelist Cup with it. He competed in Master Duel Worlds last year with it. Or, or I don't know that he was like necessarily playing that, but he did compete in Master Duel Worlds last right. year. Um, really oh, cool. he took a rough loss. Now I think about it, there was some. Un- I, re- I don't remember exactly what it was. It took some unfortunate kind of loss in like the finals or yeah. something. People were, but either way, he's one of my favorite um players. I saw people talking about this on Reddit, and it was sort of interesting to me because uh, it was like a Reddit thread. It's like Ryan Yu wins like you know Master Duel Duel's Cup with Labyrinth, and like he posted his deck list and everything. And the first thing that people did was like just complain about Labyrinth. 
Like they were just like, here's why Labyrinth needs to get banned. You can see it's like so broken. And it, I felt kind of annoyed because it was like people weren't really congratulating him on the win. Like, I mean, it's because for the vast majority of players, you know, it's not the pilot, it's the deck. Yeah. I mean, there are players who understand that the pilot is paramount. But I think for the vast majority of Yu-Gi-Oh players, they look for what they know. They know the decks. That deck's the problem. Yeah. I know. Even it's if like, this, this is a multi-time like, to... competitor. Yeah. I thought that was kind of interesting because when I saw that, I was like, wow, that sounds kind of difficult given that like Labyrinth has sort of fallen off a bit in Master Duel. Mm. It's gotten a couple of banlist hits. They've been small, but they have been a little more meaningful than people maybe think. And they smack down the furniture a little bit. Yeah. Right? Both the, fur- the two main like furniture pieces are at two... Which is a small consistency hit, but it does affect the deck's ability to like play on that first turn. Um, they got Transaction Rollback in Master Duel, which is a good card. However, it's a tougher card to use when you aren't seeing your furniture because you kind of need that in order to get to it like, like discarded it and stuff. So it's and as he as it turned out, he wasn't even using Transaction Rollback in his deck. Which I thought mm. so a funny thing about that was like somebody in the comments was complaining like. See, this is why Labyrinth is so broken and so busted, and like they need to get banned even more. And they just got transaction rollback, and that's OP and unfair. And like, and it's like, yeah, he wasn't running that. So, Jeez. you know, it, it's just kind of, I don't know. Don't get me wrong. Like, I totally get like the idea of not liking facing Labyrinth. It's an annoying deck when it's working. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think that in this case, it's clearly not the best deck in Master Duel right now, and so he did. It's have a surprise to. to see, you know, especially given the style, uh, the format of a Duelist Cup, that the best deck didn't just win. Yeah, you would think. Well, there's so many people competing with Snake Eye, and there's, you know, you don't get knocked out if you lose. You just have to keep playing and playing and playing. You'd think a Snake Eyes player would have taken it. Yeah. So. Uh, that's all really in the Master Duel Cup thing. I mean, nothing super major. I know the game's going to be doing maintenance um, tonight, like the night of the 28th. So probably some pre- preparing for a new event, maybe mm-hmm. some new stuff in the shop. The, Perhaps uh, a ban list will come soon for Master Duel since the Duelist Cup's over. They're more regular about it, that's for sure. Yeah, Master Duel ban lists come pretty quick, so... I, I I can't wait to see the reaction from Yu-Gi-Oh! players. Ban list is out! Oh, it's a Master Duel ban list! Well, it's kind of... There's a unique opportunity here where, like, it feels like the TCG, this is, like, the week it should get one. And then Master Duel, it kind of feels like it's also um, due for one now that the Duelist Cup is over. Double and OCG ban list is, drop? Well, triple, because the OCG is releasing its ban list, like, on the... Or its ban list is going into effect on April 1st. Right. So all three games could actually have, like, a new ban list go into effect on the same day. And that could be symbolically mm. neat. It doesn't really mean, like, anything. Yeah, but it, it doesn't. You know, just the the concept of that would be neat. Yeah, on in Duel Links, we got the uh, Sherry LeBlanc character. Uh, oh yeah, you mentioned her last week. week. How's uh, that going? It, I mean, fine, I guess. Uh, Sherry's inclusion in the game feels lackluster. Uh, Duel Links is a, is a you know it's anime first, and it feels like they did not. It doesn't. It doesn't. It, Sherry doesn't feel like that interesting of a character to put into the game. I know her role in Five Ds was kind of limited, but even then, I there weren't. There are not many like character interactions or voice lines with her. And then her cards are specifically limited right now. They, um, I mean, it's make Chevalier and then Bar- Barone, and that, that's it. Now, allegedly, we're supposed to get more of those cards, like Sage de Fleur. We're supposed to be getting more of the Fleur cards soon. But right now, you know, she's not doing anything. And that just, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Um. Okay, so I saw a couple of, there haven't been, like, very many card reveals in the last week. Mm-mm. Like, for Infinite Forbidden, I saw there was one new um, Guardian of the Voiceless Voice, like it's like a continuous trap that they're getting in. in oh, Infinite yeah. Forbidden. It summons a Skull Guardian, right? Yeah, I saw that. There's a tour guide from the Underworld figure that you can now pre-order. Actually. I almost locked that in, but I had to tell myself, relax, it's okay. You don't yeah. need to click this button. She has like interchangeable hands, one where she's waving a flag or another one where she's Stop it. I, I already you. stopped myself from ordering it. Includes a Sangin. All right. I'm late. Let me go back to the page. No, yeah, no, so, I'm not um, doing it. Not pre-orders have opened on Hobby Japan for Amakuni's tour guide from the Underworld figure. They will run from the 25th of March to the 30th of July, 2024, with mm-hmm. shipping scheduled from December to January. So, um, 
I mean, tour guide, it's kind of interesting. Tour guide's become this. It's a mascot. Like, mas- like pseudo mascot of it's, like, of like TCG Yu-Gi-Oh. I wonder if, could you, would you say that this is the modern TCG DMG? It kind of feels that way. Like, a it feels like bit. Dark Magician Girl is like the girl mascot of the anime, but of the TCG, it feels like like tour guide and who else, right? Yeah, no one seems to. There doesn't seem to be like a consistent kind of female mascot character for Yu Gi Oh besides tour guide. She's in all the games. Yeah, she she shows up a lot in the games as like a mascot. She, this card came out in like two thousand like eleven or twelve or something, and. A so fan favorite when she came out. Oh yeah, fan favorite when it came out, and the fact that it's kind of persisted as like a, it, it, it's it's a popular thing. So. And then and with retrains. Yeah, it's gotten some retrains in different forms. It's also managed to be relevant in numerous decks, like after release, mm-hmm. like Burning Abyss and like Unchained, and so kind of cool. I don't know. I, I, think I people I are always this. looking for a chance to uh, use uh, to use tour guide. It kind of reminds me. Of way back in a day when we were throwing Deep Sea Diva into anything we possibly could. Yes, I do remember. Yeah, Deep Sea Diva, that was another really big one. It kind of feels like a, like a rescue cat type, type mm-hmm. of card. Like, useful for a lot of strategies. If you can make it work, go ahead and do it. Yeah. Um. So, I guess that's uh, pretty much like the Yu-Gi-Oh! news, huh? Yeah. Well, I do have a, yeah. I do have one Yu-Gi-Oh! story. Oh, okay. Yes. What do you got? So, <clears throat> the headline reads, two men arrested over theft of $5 million or 5 million yen Yu-Gi-Oh card in Akihabara. Oh, yeah. Okay, I saw this story. So, Tokyo police have arrested two men on suspicion of stealing a trading card from the popular Yu-Gi-Oh series worth 4.98 million yen or about $33,000 yeah, okay. at a store near Akihabara Station in Tokyo. We've been near Akihabara Station in Tokyo. Yeah, it was, um, I have the story pulled up too. It's uh, Fuku Fuku Fuku. Or sorry, just Fuku Fuku. We probably were in there because we, we went to have, a lot yeah, of card we shops we went to a lot of area. Yu-Gi-Oh card shops. That's interesting. The suspects, Sora Takashino and Kanta Sanmi, both 22, are accused of conspiring to steal the prized Blue Eyes White Dragon card. Yeah, There's they were something. like Kaiba. They were trying to take the fourth <laughs> Blue Eyes, trim your Blue Eyes old man, and I'll trade you all of these. Like, it's interesting. So there's a Blue Eyes card in Japan worth 33 grand. Yeah, I don't know which one it is. I saw Rhyme Style on Twitter was saying, like, he's been in that job and he's seen that exact like blue eyes it's just one that they have like kind of sort of out of out on display i want to see a thirty three thousand dollar blue eyes yeah according to police at around 4 50 p.m on march 13th hey that was my birthday takashino entered the trading card store in tokyo chiyota ward and asked the store clerk to take out take the card out of his display case so he could inspect its condition before pocketing the card while the store clerk was distracted. Hmm. So th- he Very took classic. a $33,000 card. Crazy enough, it took it out the case, but he just put it in his pocket. I'm actually surprised that like that sort of thing, I guess in Japan, maybe there's like more trust around that sort of thing. I just feel like I wouldn't, expect a card shop to even like let that fly like you wouldn't that's not the way that you would like basically you have to like come to the back and like come to like almost a private room to like look at the card and just it feels like something that wouldn't not just like kind of out in the sales floor sort of thing or just right at the counter that it is strange because then it says he then allegedly got into a car that was waiting near the store and made a quick escape so the getaway the getaway driver was just sitting there this was the plan yeah they had a they they kind of just knew that if they asked to see the card that they would just be able to get the card in hand Hmm. i hope it was in a slab or something because i feel like in the midst of all that it could have gotten damaged yeah almost certainly would have gotten damaged um i saw this quote do you have the quote that he said no, I don't have the quote. Yeah, as reported by Sora News 24, the first man, Sora Takashino, was quoted to have said, I did it to have money for living and entertainment expenses. So, did they have to throw in entertainment expenses? Why yeah. did you just say, I did it so I could live? Yeah, living expenses maybe could have elicited some degree of, I mean, it's, you're still stealing. But <laughs> entertainment just makes it sound like you were just being selfish and greedy. And then, 
Well, I wonder what the strategy was here. You still a thirty three thousand dollar card. How are you gonna move that? Well, uh, I saw some more information on that in my version of the article from Dick Serto. Wow, Paul the shouting them out. Best source for these sorts of viral things. Kanta Sanmi, the second man who was riding the car, added, I didn't think that Takashino had stolen anything. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, but contrary to what both men admitted, the car was reportedly sold at another store nearby for a lot less money than it was worth. According to reports, the men sold it for 1 million yen, which is about $6,600. Presumably, the men cut the price down to shift it quickly before getting caught. So you, That's crazy that the uh, the shop that bought it weren't like, Curious, like, hey, this card's this card's worth a lot of money. You sure you want to sell it for just for just this? Yeah, I mean, I guess they just wanted to get it off their hands fast, so they they were willing to. I know. mean, that is the way. If you want to move something quickly, you take a huge loss on it. But golly, I mean, I feel like you could have stolen other things. I don't know. I mean. <laughs> Don't steal anything. <laughs> I look. I can't help but critique the the prac there's technique when stealing things. Well, like you shouldn't steal, but if you're gonna do it, I think I think you should do it better. I don't know. Yeah, it was kind of cool. I saw this sort of just going a little mini viral on Twitter, so that was cool to see a, a Yu Gi Oh story kind of hit the mainstream. Most people call them goofballs and clowns. We don't but, have many Yu-Gi-Oh stories, but I'm glad to see that we are still that like other card games, we do steal. We still yeah, we're still, still stealing, stealing Yu-Gi-Oh cards. <laughs> yeah, cuz like everyone steals cards. magic and Pokemon, but you don't yeah, hear you many Yu-Gi-Oh stories. We have a Pokemon theft story in this podcast like every week. It so. feels it's so constant, but I'm glad someone values Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Yeah. Now you shouldn't steal them, but like, you know, yeah. <laughs> okay, anywho, um Moving on, then. What do we have? So, Magic the Gathering, they're, they're coming out with their Thunder Junction set. It's a new set for MTG. Okay. And there's a new kind of mini game that can be played while playing Commander. Mini game while playing? Okay. Because they love this sort of thing in that game. I don't know how to keep up with it. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Upcoming Magic the Gathering set, Outlaws of Thunder Junction, is introducing a new mini game for Commander. In the same vein as Plane Chase, the new Bounties system will add greater variety and unpredictability to your Commander games. It features a separate shared deck of Bounty cards, so a separate deck of cards, which players will compete to earn rewards for completing. Bounties are optional missions that any Commander player can go after. For instance, the Bounty card, The Outsider, asks you to cast a spell from anywhere apart from your hand during your turn. So typically in Magic, you have to cast like spells from your hand. But there are certain effects and certain spells that can be cast from like your grave, your, from, the, uh, fr- from different zones other than your hand, okay? Yeah. And it says, the longer a bounty has gone unfulfilled, the better its rewards will be. So, for instance, the first turn a bounty is revealed, the reward from c- for completing it is just one treasure. And treasure can be com- uh, converted into mana, so treasure is really valuable. But if it isn't completed for three turns, the reward will be two treasure tokens and drawing a card. So, the, essentially, you want to be the one to complete the bounty to get the reward, but if you... But if you just wait for like a few more turns, risking someone else completing the bounty first, you can get a larger reward. Okay. That's all while you're playing a normal game of Commander. So, games within games. Games within games. I think that that, though, speaks to kind of a the social part of it. Where, mm-hmm. like... Because I guess this is sort of optional. Yeah. Like, you don't really have to do it. But I think that if you were, like, in a Commander pod with some friends... And, like, it's not really being taken super seriously anyway. That it would probably be kind of fun to add this in. So, Cause like, that sounds neat. I think in in those, like, competitive commander games, they end so fast. Something like this. It will be hard to find any, like, joy in this bounty system. But if you're playing in a more, like, casual pod, it's going to go for some turns. You know, no one's playing too crazy. Oh, there goes our main camera. Cool. That was fast. That was early. <laughs> Golly. Maybe it'll turn back on later on. Does it do that? I have to do it. Continue. <laughs> but yeah, if you're playing in a pod where it's going to go for a few turns anyway, you know, something like this, you're going to spice things up. You know, it just adds more reason to interact with like your other players. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool magic news. I also saw um, that they announced the set for release date for Disney Lorcana TCG. This is just kind of a press release style update. Okay. But, you know, we sometimes try to cover those in here. Uh, <laughs> these, what? what? These always start out, like, so pretentious. These press releases. Ravensburger, the award-winning publisher of games, puzzles, and toys, held its inaugural Disney Lorcana Lorecast live stream event. Like, I... All right, so much relax. Like, okay, we get it. Anyways, um, Urs- Ursula? Ursula. Ursula? Ursula's return, the fourth set of the Disney Lorcana TCG, brings even more Disney characters into the game and evolved game mechanics while also continuing the story told over the first three sets. The Illumineer's Quest Deep Trouble is a brand new cooperative game that will have... Wait, is it another game within a game? Sounds that like we'll it. That will have players facing Disney's Ursula in an epic battle for the first time. Ooh. Both products will be released first at local game stores, Walt Disney World Resort, Disneyland Resort, Disneyland Paris, Disney... Okay, whatever. And then, um... That's all going to be on May 17th. And then it'll release to mass market retailers on May 31st. And so that co-op game sounds like one of those raid-style... Um, co-op card games where you reveal a random boss and then the players cooperate to take it down. Here's some info about it. Yeah, it sounds a little like that. Players can either team up with friends or undertake a solo mission to defeat the glimmer of Ursula and save Lorcana in the Illumineer's quest Deep Trouble, which is the first Disney Lorcana TCG cooperative game. The game follows the Illumineers as they track down the malevolent glimmer Ursula to her lair at the edge of Lorcana. Unfortunately, Ursula has been preparing for the Illumineer's arrival by entangling other glimmers with mind control. Okay, how do you play it? That's all I'm really concerned about. Gotta the game includes cards. a guided gameplay area for Ursula, two pre-constructed TCG decks featuring Disney's Mulan and Yen Sid and built with cards from the first four Lorcana sets and then a fierce Ursula deck. The Sea Witch plays by her own rules. There's four difficulty levels ranging from easy to extreme, um, with each level offering rule variations that make the play experience unique. Ursula's power increases throughout the game, so players are encouraged to customize their decks for their best chance of success at the extreme difficulty level. Mm -hmm. Endlessly replayable. That sounds cool. The game includes everything needed for one to two players and can be expanded up to four players with additional Lorcana decks. That's actually kind of neat sounding. Yeah. I, you know, it would be cool if Yu-Gi-Oh! had something like that. We could never, a but boy, it would be cool. Yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh! would break a boss rush. It would Like, you'd work. have to... It's so interesting because, like, if Yu-Gi-Oh! did that, it'd be like, okay, you're facing, like, a Blue-Eyes Chaos Max Dragon, right? And, like, it can't be targeted and destroyed. It has, like, 4,000 attack, does double piercing. We'd out it in one turn. But the thing is, like, you'd have to ban so many things. Like, you can't kaiju it. You can't whatever. But also, you have to just limit what each person can do on their turn. Because otherwise, someone would just do the long 10-minute combo that just makes some huge thing that outs it or whatever. Like you'd have to really temper it down to, like, make a proper like, difficulty. It, it would be too difficult, I think, because there's so many things that can go wrong, given how Yu-Gi-Oh! works. Yeah. You could have players create crazy, like, decks that just out whatever whatever boss you make, they can out it on the first turn, or they can make insane boards that brick the game up where they can never lose yeah that too and then i it, uh, yeah like, Yu-Gi-Oh is a it's beast. so crazy because Yu Gi Oh having like a a raid battle effectively would be fun mm-hmm. like they have them in dual links there's so much oh do they yeah how does that work essentially you um you play against an, a, an opponent with that has an astronomical amount of life points Okay. Same same basic idea. Do they have like a big boss monster? Yeah, anything? there's usually a, there's there's like a big boss monster. It looks really cool, and um, there's usually like way the multipliers to deal like extra damage and whatnot. Yeah, I feel like that could that could be fun. Like having multipliers to deal more damage. Maybe their boss monster, in addition to just having high attack, maybe here I am getting invested in like I have a little <laughs> mini rule set. But like basically, the boss monster. You know, like in the Pokemon raid battles, like in Scarlet and Violet, right? It was like Sword and Shield. You had to kind of like break their barriers to, in order to do oh, yeah. damage. Oh yeah, all the raids that do that. Yeah, I think that'd be cool. Where it's like you can swing over it, but that won't actually destroy it. Like you have to still swing over it in battle like three times before it actually begins to maybe take de- something like that. Where you and like your group have to really like work together to make this whole thing. I'm not working of, with anybody. My deck's gonna beat on one in one turn. So yeah, you're a Yu-Gi-Oh player. Well, yeah. This is how it is. 
Yeah, I think that'd be kind of fun. So this is what Lurkana is doing. Um, would you be willing to give this sort of thing a crack? Ursula's return and the whatever the second thing. The issue for me is just it's getting invested in Lorcana. I can't do it. It's too many card games. You're the card gamer, man. You I know. Play I have on. a deck. I have a Seven Dwarves deck. It's bad, but I do have it. You know, I had another story, too, about Star Wars Unlimited, but I realized that every story I find about that game is like a sponsored just... Like, like a review. review. Yeah. So it's like I'm always like, oh, cool, like a, a Star Wars Unlimited article. Maybe it's saying something new, but it's always just kind of like, Star Wars Unlimited is the game for you. They and sent like, review copies of the game to just about everybody but us. So Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's... I guess it's doing reasonably well, but I wouldn't know. I've heard so. I've heard a lot of anecdotal interests. The, the question the question will will be um, around the time of that set like their second set second, release. Third, how set many release. players are left? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know how like Lorcan is necessarily doing. The only game that I feel has actually blown up and stayed big is One Piece. I mean, One Piece I think is popular within the TCG networks that we move through. The um, Lorcana is a bit different. We're not too in tune with like the magic community and like and the Pokemon community. I think Lorcana players are more similar to magic and Pokemon players, so we won't really hear yeah, much about know. them. You might hear about the occasional very expensive card to pull mm-hmm. or something, but yeah, I mean, but I do hear One Piece gets played and like bought and sold. As a Digimon player, I can't help but hear about One Piece. Yeah. Bandai. So, uh, kind of an interesting thing. Just, oh. Oh. That just triggered something. I, I don't know if there's a story for this, but Union Arena, like, uh, what are the, what would they, what would you call those? Like, sneak peek or pre-release kits are, like, going are around? going out? Oh, let me see if I can find a story about it. Because I saw yeah, Chris, Chris yeah. yeah, he shared something in the chat with, uh, looks like an, it was a like Union Arena, like, early something. An early something. Huh? An early something. Somebody's got Union Arena cards somewhere, and I don't care. Well, I do care. They have Nikkei cards in Japan, so I care a little. Well, but I just not saw a lot. the Nikkei expansion, actually. But that's in Japan. That's not here. And it's probably, it, I mean, there's a real chance that won't even come to the States. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but I do remember seeing that. So, um. Bandai. Yeah. Union Arena, like early. Cause like, cause Release. Union Arena that drops in the summer, right? This summer. I thought it was in the fall. I think it's, yeah, it drops some at a super pre release event on August twenty third. So like okay, late so it's summer, in the fall. basically. And I guess next year we're gonna get the Dragon Ball card game. I mean the uh, Sandland card game. Yeah, man, the card games don't stop. Do Bandai. Stop. Yeah, Bandai is doing like all of these. They're doing way it's too much. It's actually insane. Um, they, this they. I remember when I remember when I thought Bushy Road had too many car games. Bandai has blown that completely out of the water. Do we don't hear a lot from Bushy Road these days, do we? I think because Bushy Road right now is kind of take at least in the in the states. Bushy Road is the one that's taking the L from Bandai's continuous just drop of card games. Yeah, there's Bandai like it's like a new card game like, basically twice a year. So, well, I mean, they do have they, now they they do have a player base. It's just. I think they are the ones suffering the most. Okay, so I went on their website and I found oh wait, the super pre release event. This was just the announcement of it on August twenty third. Okay, so that's not I was trying to see where the announcement of like whatever it was that Chris got his hands like, on. It looked is. like it looked like a demo deck of some kind. Like that maybe it was given yeah. out at some convention, some like maybe yeah, some like insider OTS thing. Shops, something. I don't know. Well, if somebody knows, I would like to hear a little bit more if you're interested in U- Union Arena, if you've been following it at all. Um, yeah, uh, you can let Paul know. Don't let me know. You can let Alec know. I think he'd be more likely to play it than me. Well, anyways, okay, any other card game stories? I don't care for that slander. You would literally be more likely to play a new card game than I would. I won't do it. Oh, look at that. What'd you find? So there was a demo deck event for Union Arena. Okay. So it says Union Arena Demo Deck event will be free to attend and take place at local game stores. Don't miss the opportunity to experience the Union Arena card game. Uh, the date just said mid March 2024. 
So I guess. So I guess that's happening. That's what that was. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what that was. And I guess it's just ha- it may have already happened in your area. It might be happening soon in your area. I guess look it up. I don't know. Okay. Well, cool. I guess if you got to go to that, I would like to hear what it was like. When did you enjoy it? Have a good time? What were what were your what card game what are, are you dropping for it? Like demo deck, so it's probably all the same thing. Yeah, what card game will leave your rotation in order for you to play Union Arena, or will you be one of the Mad Men who adds it to your? Repertoire? Stop looking at me when you say that. I'm not doing it. Okay. Well, anywho, any more card game stories that are happening? Uh, I I was thinking there might be nothing. some Pokemon, but I didn't see any this week. I mean, there's, so. I know they have a new, they have, they have like like set announcements, but. I didn't see any like Pokemon stories. It feels like a lot of at least their competitive scene is winding down. It feels like a lot of players, I guess, have already scored their invites to Nat. So okay, I saw one Pokemon trading card game taps Nichi Joe manga author Keiji Arai. Oh, okay, I like for Nichijou. an animated ad, a new short that promotes the Battle Academy starter sets. Wait, I need to see that. Yeah, so um. It's, I think it's a Japanese one, but um, yeah, I'll watch it here in a second. Sometimes collaborations you never even knew you needed appear out of thin air. That's certainly the case with the latest Pokemon trading card game campaign. The Pokemon company teamed up with uh, manga creator Keiichi Arui for a, an animated ad that suits the author's style perfectly. The ad, which features illustrations and animation, is all about providing an entry point to those who want to play Pokemon cards for the first time. It promotes the two-player Battle Academy starter set. Oh, that's smart of them so, to do whatever it takes to push that product. Yeah. Um, interesting. <laughs> it's like a. So we're just like watching this. I guess I'll try to have the video like playing so people can sort of see what we're talking about. But it's this is certainly a take on marketing. Yeah, it's a really fast-paced, kind of just quirky, cartoony ad. But it does line up with, uh, like, because I've seen Nietzsche Joe, and this makes sense. This makes sense. Yeah, very short. Um, short and sweet ad, but cool. Okay. Um, not, like, a huge deal or anything, but I will say this. They are doing a good job of promoting those two-player Battle Academy starter sets, aren't they? Um, oh, okay. He resisted, y'all. Let's uh, everybody yes. give Paul a pat on the shoulder. Yeah, there are other companies that don't always do as effective a job at promoting <laughs> their two-player starter sets. Speaking but of promotion, I got a rant real quick. Do you? I do. Okay, good. You're stopping me from it. All right. So uh, last week I went to the shop, right, and they had the re-release Yugi's Legendary Dex Two product. Yeah. And the shop owner had had almost no idea like what it really was. He looked it up and was like, "Why does it say this product from 2016?" I'm like, "Because it is." He's like, "Oh, so oh, you're talking about hold up, I got it. Continue." Yeah, so he was like, "Yeah, yeah, this is a uh, it's a product from 2016. They're re-releasing." I had to explain to him like what the deal was with this product, and because talking I, about this, by the way, guys, the our the shop had Jerry Dex uh, too. The shop had inadvertently purchased it, but they didn't really know what it was. As so I had to give them the lowdown on the product, I said, despite the fact that this product looks all shiny and eye-catching, um, it's actually not readily apparent what it is unless you look at the back the back of the product, which the customer will almost never see. Yeah, it depends on how your shop, I guess. Like, because like who's but who's displaying it like from the back? Like, who's well, doing this? I mean, like at our card shop, it's like literally in a glass shelf, so like they just couldn't see it. Whereas at some card shops, you can like still pick it up. Yeah, you'd have look, to like so. pick it up. I but I still don't care for it because when I saw when I saw the product, it it was obvious it was Yu Gi Oh because gold Millennium Eye. I saw it from the side, so I knew what it was. But I don't like that it doesn't actually say like what it is. it is on the front cover or even the sides of it i had to tell them that you need to tell people, people what, what this is. product is because i i don't think a lot of your core Yu Gi Oh players are going to buy this product but i do think very casual Yu Gi Oh enjoyers would be willing to buy it since it is three decks in one product but they won't know that just looking at it you have to tell them yeah, um, I I mean, I've got my own set of, like, so we have opened this already and played at least one duel with it. You might see a second duel soon on the channel. I mean, what do you mean, um, Paul? We've played so many duels with this product. Well, technically, we've played a lot in the past, <laughs> too. But, uh, you know, that's what happens when you re-release the product, like, eight years later. Um, so, I don't have, a, like, a huge issue, actually, with this thing's existence. I know last week I was very confused by it. 
I think I get what it's really about. Casual people buy it and it promotes like the new Exodia thing. Great, simple, whatever. But here's my like thing with, I think that when they do stuff like this, because mm -hmm. so when we were opening this, I read some of the cards in here and these aren't even like updated with problem solving card text. Like it still reads graveyard instead of GY yep. on like a lot of these cards and stuff. And to me, that's like, like you could at least. <laughs> it almost feels like they had these sitting in storage from inventory. 2016. Like, and they were like, let's just put them back on the market. Yeah, it also is a little bit of a slap in the face to like a red eyes, blue eyes, or dark magician sort of player because those decks all have new cards now, right? Like dark magician, like Eternal Soul had kind of just come out around the time this was releasing, but just. There are other, you know, new Dark Magician cards, like Magician Souls, right. that, that's in need of a reprint. Or Blue Eyes has, you know, stuff like the Bingo Machine. Red Eyes has cried. Um, <laughs> but, no, but even Red Eyes has, like, some new things. Yeah, like Dragoon. Eyes, yeah, Dragoon. And Insight's not even here. You Insight I mean? is not in there. So I think that this would have been a neat re-release if it just updated the decks a little bit with some of the modern support that it has. And like you said, improve the front of the box a little bit. Because like I don't have a this is cool, but I think that you could probably do a little more to say what it is. When I saw the product, the, the see this product is so shiny and gold, you can barely actually make out what's on it. Yeah, like it's it's interesting because it's stylized and it might have even worked really well for a tin. Mm -hmm. But I think like you can maybe make the these characters like have black outlines instead of gold so you can tell who they are and then some text to like let people know what it is. Like, and this is nitpicky. It's probably like a uh, so one marketer said one thing, one marketer said another. But I would have made this inside square of the product. Exactly. I would have made the inside square black, and then the hieroglyphics would have been trace would have been outlined in gold. And so with the characters, so that they would actually stand yeah, some out. Contrast, some contrast. Because uh, I just wanted to be able to look at that product and know three decks, one product. That's yeah. Like I think you could sort of say like you know three decks in one like mm -hmm. that way that's the kind of the selling. Sorry, I, I get in so into these like these marketing things, and I don't want to I guess come across as like I've sold some successful card game. I know what's best because I don't, but I do know what I see at the card shop when people are kind of unaware of what a thing is or like they're kind of skipping over it. I just don't like. That Konami is releasing something that a card shop has to try to sell themselves. They, I think, they need you need to help your card shops by putting the marketing on the product so that it would help them move the things. So you want to re-release them. It's anyway. actually kind of funny. Uh, our card shop recently got this thing, this glowing Pokeball. Oh yeah, I saw yeah. That. So I actually got a video of this. I might add it onto the. Uh, like on here, but basically there's this like glowing Pokeball. It's provided by the Pokemon company. Mm -hmm. It's just a little glowing Pokeball case that you're supposed to put whatever the most recent, like newly released product or set is. Like you put the packs in there, and so now it's like on display, and it's like a glowing Pokeball, so it catches your eye. It's like, oh yeah, this is the newest Pokemon set. And they were telling me how like this is like the kids notice it immediately, like it's just like glowy thing. Yep, this is the new pack. And it kind of made me think, Yu-Gi-Oh, I know it's obviously not as recognizable as, like, a Pokeball, but, like, put a Millennium Puzzle, kind of just the upside down, like, pyramid puzzle, and it's glowing, and now, like, this is the newest Yu-Gi-Oh set. This is the one to buy. For OTS stores, this is a way to, like, let people know, if you know nothing else about Yu-Gi-Oh, start here. Like, here's the either the newest set, or here's the starter set, or whatever. And I, I think that would be, like, a cool thing. So. Is that Yu-Gi-Oh has no culture for that style of advertising. Yeah, it like, doesn't. We don't usually go for eye catching, just in your face style marketing. We just throw up a, a little a picture of Yugi and he does all and the work pray. himself. He's just Yeah, that that are like it's just, you know, people who are kind of already the they're so locked in, like the competitive types, so they already know Yeah, like core Yu Gi Oh players, we know that we know this we seek out the Yu Gi Oh products. Yeah, you know, but exactly normal what people, you, you know, they have options. Well, before we get too negative, let's just change gears and talk about a news story. Do you have Fine. anything fun for us? I've got I know there's a lot of gaming stuff. Let's see. I also have gaming stuff. All right, you can you start us off and I've got one too. All right, so I'm going to start off with the big story for today. Okay. At least today as of uh Wednesday, not your Thursday. Uh Marvel Rivals. Yeah, I saw the trailer for this. It's a mix of Overwatch and superhero battles. Okay. 
<clears throat> I'm sure they're not saying that exactly. That's just the headline. But yeah, I know you're right. Marvel's on a roll with its new game announcements. After teasers and rumors, Marvel Games revealed Marvel Rivals, a 6v6 hero shooter that blends the best of Marvel action games like Ultimate Alliance with the tactical multiplayer elements of Overwatch and Valorant. In Marvel Rivals, players will assemble Avengers, X-Men, Guardians, and a motley crew of heroes and villains throughout the Marvel multiverse. At launch, the roster will be 16 characters, including Black Panther, Storm, and Magneto, with developer NetEase promising new heroes with each seasonal update. You can check out the full roster of characters here. I'm just going to click the link just so I can see all 16 characters. Or at least I would, except that led me to a video. I just want to see a list of... They, they lied to me. I'm just going to... Wait, what is it? No, I don't want to click that. Okay, I give up. I, I give up. I can't see I mean, the I saw some of the characters. I saw, like, Spider-Man and, like, the Hulk. Right? They were in that. Spider-Man and the Hulk are in it, but that was obvious, Paul. Oh yeah, that's the, but that's like what's gonna Marvel sell. fans I mean, care about the niche picks. Okay. It's the it's the weird ones we care about. Well, who who do you care about? Well, more I they? mean, it's not. I mean, this, okay. So, unsub, if you played enough of these um, Net Marble Net Ease Marvel games, you should be familiar with a character named Luna Snow. Luna Snow is a Korean hero that was essentially made because the developers of these games are are Korean, and she's put in every single one of them and it was just interesting to see luna snow as once again a launch character in a game being marketed in the west and it's like i just get i get a bad feeling when that happens not to say the luna snow character isn't isn't good and she's been put in comics afterwards but i can't help but remember that net ease is a, like a mobile first game developer so you worry about whether or not they'll be able to do like a kind of PC kind of console based. Can they do? Can thing. they? Because a Marvel game, like if, the way it's being marketed, this has to be a triple A Marvel hero shooter. Yeah. And I don't know if I believe, I don't know if NetEase is capable of delivering on what we're expecting here. Because everyone's throwing around the word Overwatch. Yes, Overwatch has fallen off, but there's one thing Overwatch had was quality. Yeah, and I can't I can't shake this feeling that this game will launch as just a big be. mobile port. Well, I mean, I guess the best you can do is just be cautiously optimistic. Here's a list of characters that I found. Okay, what you Rocket got? Raccoon, cool. Star Lord, cool. Black Panther, Iron Man, guaranteed, guaranteed. Doctor Strange and Scarlet Witch, no surprise. Well, Namor Scarlet is cool. Namor is Magneto. an interesting one. Magneto's good. Magic with a K. Very good. Storm. Good. Penny Parker. What? Luna Snow. Loki. I don't know why. Okay, Hulk, Loki's good. Spider Man. Guaranteed, guaranteed. Groot. Mantis. Punisher. Mantis is interesting. And they put a question mark beside Galactus. So. I wonder why they put a question mark. I, mean, I guess that's Galactus. like a character that maybe was leaked but wasn't actually like shown. You know, that. More than likely, Galactus is not a character in this hero shooter just because typically, I don't know how familiar you are with the, with the, Galactus, with the Galactus character. They're this like extremely larger than life character that yeah. you can't really, like, there's no conceivable way to like scale it down to put it on par with other, with like heroes and villains of the Marvel Universe. They're probably more of like a, um, like a boss character or. Maybe the the there the reason this whole like the in lore reason why this whole hero shooter thing is happening because Galactus wouldn't make any sense as a as a normal character it just wouldn't. Okay, so overall, I mean, how how should Overwatch or Valorant, since it seemed like a bit of a mix of the two, should these games be scared, concerned? I think Valorant is safe where it is. Overwatch. Should probably be worried. I think Overwatch should be worried. Um, they have Overwatch has core fans, and that's cool. But that's kind of all they have. Most casual Overwatch fans have dropped the game by now, myself included. And uh, I think, the, and this being like a Marvel title, it's just prime to soap up every casual hero shooter player on the market. Yeah. Unless they just hate Marvel, but that's rare. They'll certainly put a lot into like marketing and the game itself. They'll make sure you hear about it. They'll make sure mm -hmm. you play it. I mean, and then launching with a roster of sixteen characters, 
more than likely, if you're a Marvel fan, there's a character that you like within that 16 somewhere, right? Like, yeah. It's a, it, that's, a, that's a good, healthy number for, for a 6v6 shooter. That means uh, unless the like balancing is horrible, there should be a lot of diversity in your matches. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that sounds nice. I think they're supposed to be starting like, you know, beta, like an alpha next month and like a beta in May and it's supposed to release in June or July. So it's so weird. The concept of the game always seems fun. Whenever I start thinking about practically playing the game, I get like this weird cold sweat. Like I'm like, oh God. Because uh, they don't know, but. You know, I played the uh, the Gundam Hero Shooter when it came out, and I really, really wanted to like it. And then after like two like two like games, I hated it. My assumption is they'll make sure that this like is. I think they're going to like try as hard as they can to capture everything they made like Overwatch really good, mm-hmm. and kind of give it the Marvel sheen and polish that it needs to. Like, I don't think they're going to release something that's like seen as boring or bad out the gate. I don't think. So. I'd hope not. Like the trailer looked fine, but that's a trailer. We've had many promising tra- trailers in this gaming industry. Yeah, it's hard to say what it comes down to with these like you know PvP sort of hero shooter games. I I don't really play any of them, so I don't know. Is there like this will be a- your first one, huh? Maybe. I mean, I I would play this if, as long as like there's a way to play it without like shooting. I don't. I'm not really very good at shooters. So. <laughs> if there's like a character that doesn't have to, you shoot, can shoot just fine. Okay. You well, you've been intimidated by Call of Duty. Yeah, I don't know. I is there like an X factor that it needs? Like, does it need to? So I think in the um, if we're just looking at the Overwatch blueprint for success, it's all of the uh, the filler that made Overwatch what it was. The filler. What do you mean? It's the voice clips. It's the Easter eggs. It's the... Yeah, that charm and characterization mm-hmm, and stuff. Which Marvel has plenty to work with. Is it all implemented in this game? I don't know. The characters are voiced, which is already better than that Gundam game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Marvel's really got a lot of... Oh, sorry, were you done? Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, is Marvel... I mean, you got to give them credit. They really... They will leverage this IP, like Disney and stuff. They'll... You know, because I mean, they got like Marvel Snap. If you just like mobile card games, and mm-hmm. you got this, and there's like Marvel what, 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 Alliance or Strike Force, or just there's so many Strike Force. That's their kind of Raid Shadow Legends game. So many different games. Like I, I just think, like if you're a Marvel fan, you are at least not starved for ways to alternate ways of engaging with these comic book characters and or movie characters. I think the one way Marvel fans have been starved a bit is like AAA game titles. Yeah, you don't Just really because get those they've much. they've been a little rough outside of Spider Man, yeah, and Spider Man almost feels disconnected somehow from like a lot of because Spider Man is like the Spider Man game. It's like they're the Spider Man games, and I think they are so much better than what's been around them that it just feels like it's yeah, they different. Feel, it's like, not even the same thing. Okay, well, here's something kind of cool. There's been a lot. Actually, there's a lot of stuff so about like this particular topic, but. So the Game Developers Conference has been happening this past week, Mm -hmm. and um, there were some interviews with Phil Spencer from Xbox. So the story that I have is around the official Xbox handheld rumors and his comments on the idea that they might make a handheld Xbox console. I also have an Xbox story. Kind of exciting. So um, Microsoft is heavily rumored to be preparing to release an official Xbox handheld, and while he stopped short of announcing it in a new interview, Xbox boss Phil Spencer went as far as to say what he wants from it. So um, he discussed various existing PC gaming handhelds, listing everything that he would add to the experience to make them feel like an Xbox. This includes having access to all your games uh, with associated save files, being able to boot into the Xbox app full screen but in a compact mode, and having all the social experiences normally found on Xbox. Um, He says, like, I want it to feel like the dash of my Xbox when I turn on the television. But I want it on those devices. So um, I'll kind of paraphrase what he's saying here in that he basically talks about, I know, the Steam Deck, the ROG Ally, um, the Lenovo. Almost bought both of those. There's like a Lenovo thing. I forget what it's called. But basically he was saying how he kind of would want each of those handheld devices to basically have a way to access the Xbox dashboard Mm -hmm. very seamlessly, very smoothly, and play your Xbox games on that, whether that's through like XCloud or just Game Pass or whatever, 
that would be the ideal way to use those devices. And um, it kind of sounded to me as though, well, here's another quote that will inform what I'm about to say. He continued, he confirmed the Xbox hardware team is considering quote, different hardware form factors and things they could go and do. What, could we build that will find new players, Spencer added, that will allow people to play at times when they couldn't go play in the past. So it does sound like a handheld. It's interesting because, like, I don't know that Xbox actually really needs to build a handheld. And I don't know that he even wants to necessarily build a handheld. I think he just kind of wants Xbox to be on handheld devices. But he said he wants those the already established devices to feel more like an Xbox. So, so maybe he can't really change the hardware. Well, I mean, he can't change the hardware of like a Steam Deck, but he can just have like Xbox Game Pass be on it natively. Or, mm-hmm. you know, same with like an ROG Ally. However, them making their own handheld would mean that they get to completely like curate the experience and it's all developed hand in hand. So it would look and Ooh. feel and function exactly how an Xbox should. But should they create another piece of hardware they take a loss on sales for? That's the thing. Cause the Xbox series X and series S have not sold as well as their main competitor, the PlayStation five, the Xbox series S though, has at least sold better than the series X. Cause it's like the cheaper one. Um, like 80 to 20, I heard, is the ratio. Woo! Like, it, it's pretty, like, most people just get a Series S and call it a day. And that Series S is one of the reasons why our next-gen games don't look as good as they could. Yeah, that's what they say. So, it's kind of a curious conundrum because, like, yeah, gaming companies usually take a loss on these consoles so that they can just get it in your hands and then sell you games. Or, in this case, maybe a streaming Controllers! Service. And even controllers. That costs about the same as a game. Yeah, so... I wonder, I mean, like, if they were to make an Xbox handheld, get into the brass tacks of it. How much are you paying for, like, an Xbox handheld? I'm not saying you, Alec, but, like, you, the gamer guy, persistent with all the options that exist in the world today and ways to play games, and maybe you're a fan of Xbox still, though. What's like, the, what are you paying? Uh, what's the price on the S? On the what? The S, the Xbox the, Series S. So the Series X, I know, is 500 and the series s is i think 299 see so ooh, they're both that puts them in a really ugly spot yeah 300 and 500 if i'm correct it has to be less than any console but there's no way they can make a good one that sells for le- for like 200 because here's the thing the stream deck like starts at 500 bucks yeah and i think the all right i'm gonna have to look up a bunch of prices here sorry you guys for being a little uh unprepared I mean, but like because yeah these handhelds that we're talking about they're expensive handhelds that cost about the same as a console they can do that because they don't they're not also offering another 500 hundred dollar product so the rog ally is 400 dollars, is what i'm seeing here i don't I, I think that's the msrp now it might also be that you can like upgrade it i don't know if it actually they tend to have some type of upgradable storage and it's higher than that i, w- I want to look on their official site to make sure i have all this right because you never you know you can like see stuff and it'll be on sale or whatever see this says it's like 700 like see what is and then this one says 600 i'm so confused as it, to what with I'm prices like cost. that it does not sound like the handheld market is something Xbox should be entering into. Yeah, it's just I know like with Stream Deck and ROG Ally basically hovering at around 4, 5, 600 dollars kind of depending on which version you get, how much memory and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. An Xbox competitor to those would have to be around the same price I assume if you want to make a similarly competitive product like with the right materials and Screen resolution, battery life, kind of like plastic versus metal and like where that all goes. And so if this thing releases from Xbox and it's an Xbox handheld, but it has to cost like four or five hundred bucks, I guess people would probably be more drawn to it because it's Xbox which is like a household name in gaming. So like for instance, I would sooner buy an Xbox handheld than like the Asus ROG Ally. Right. And maybe even before the Steam Deck, perhaps. But like still, if it costs like the price that an Xbox Series X is, it's and like what we were the, talking about. These last handhelds week, like, are we are they are less powerful than their console contemporaries. Yeah, you're paying for the convenience. So it's it feels like that's a hard marketing move to then have a console and a handheld at around the same price, price. point. Mm-hmm. It's like weird. 
you're re- you're putting your customers in a very awkward position. Something's gonna hurt the other, and I still don't think they'll be making a lot of. They're, I, st- I, I don't think you actually can sell these handhelds at a profit. So yeah, I'm kind of curious about like where that goes because I think um they would probably just be because like it seems like Microsoft wants to do more so games as a service. They want you to subscribe to Game Pass Ultimate or whatever for like twenty. Dollars a month, or however much it, it is. It's a pretty good value, and they just kind of want you to play that. And they don't care what you play it on. They really don't. They they, they wanted to bring it on the Switch and like the PlayStation. They I got do it not on. Care I got it on my Meta Quest Three. Yeah, so I mean, and you can get that on like the ROG Ally already. So what Phil Spencer maybe wants more so is just like an entire Xbox interface, kind of that's also on those. But I, I don't know that I would. That they need to make a, a handheld console for that. I mean, it does seem like maybe they want to work closer with these hardware developers to have more native functionality with Xbox software in with their hardware. I think because that can be a better that could be a big selling point. Like if they partnered with ROG and not like the Steam Deck and the ROG has more functionality with Xbox Game Pass and Xbox titles than the Steam Deck. That could be some I could I could push someone's buying decision one way or the other, right? Yeah. So, uh, cool interview. I mean, I thought that was a cool thing. I know there's there's like a billion other things you said that people have analyzed. So, mm-hmm. but as for the the mobile or like handheld Xbox, I don't really think it's something that they need to do. If they do it, I won't really be like. I mean, obviously, I'm not the intended customer. I don't really have like an Xbox or anything, but. I'd be curious if people would buy it. I don't think it's like worth trying to have to fight with existing handhelds with like the ROG Ally and the Steam Deck, and then like also the Switch. Yeah, because like you still have to get like that to kind of continue. And, and wasn't there a rumor like some weeks ago about there being a Sony handheld coming back to the market? I hope that doesn't happen. Like, they, all right, we got to relax the handheld like, market, y'all. It's, well, it's, it's, mm. I want to move on from this. So there's one other thing to say too, which is that it kind of is that weird thing that we all wanted as kids. Like, do, were you at all, you or your friends, like, you know, you, you play consoles, like, I have an Xbox, you got a PlayStation, I got a GameCube, whatever, and, like, we also all want them to have, like, the handheld versions, like, there's the PSP, because it was, like, oh, a big deal PSP. when it came out, and there's the oh. Game Boy Advance, or the DS, and, like, Xbox can make a handheld, too, and they can, instead of the Xbox 360, they can call it the Xbox 180, and it's, like, the handheld one, so it's, like, there's, like, it's a... It's the 180, it's flat. There's a magical world of, like, all the major console manufacturers also have a handheld, and, like, we buy those... But it's just like, this is such a cutthroat market we're in where, like, game studios are already closing down and stuff. I just, it's scary to, like... I mean, times have changed quite a bit since then, right? The the cost and the, the type of hardware we're packing into uh, handhelds just on the regular now is completely different from how it was back then. The The handheld market is not for the faint of heart. I don't think I, yeah, I, don't, I don't think, think they can they just, just make need, one because you know, they you can want like barge to in because you want to or because it sounds like a cool idea. Because I mean, we we saw how long it took for the Steam Deck to get off the ground, and it was a bit of a trial by fire. And they they don't have it all figured out. It also seems to me like it, right now with gaming, it's more. It feels like it's less of a hardware conversation and more of a software conversation right now, like. The PS5 Pro, I don't have a story on this, but the PS5 Pro specs got like leaked or confirmed or something. How true they are, I don't know, but it seems reliable right now. I've heard mm-hmm. a lot of outlets talking about it. And uh, the thing about that is like the PS5 Pro specs don't seem to be, you know, leaps and bounds actually even much better than the PS5. Better, A lot better in some areas, not super better in others. But also it's like how much is this thing going to cost? Like 600 bucks or something because it's like a Pro. And what a lot of people seem to be saying is that we don't need a pro because this generation of consoles so far has not actually gotten very many great games. A lot of stuff is still cross-platform, like it's released on the PS4 and 5 or mm-hmm. Xbox One and the Series X. And, and bottlenecks, how good the games can you Yeah, perform. so a lot of games feel bottlenecked and it just feels like there haven't been a lot of like, I can only experience this on next-gen style experiences. And so when you look at it that way, it's like, it's not a matter of getting a stronger, beefier PS5 that like, you know, runs things better, it's, can the games actually be good to begin with? Or are we going to have more, like, microtransaction hell, live service hell? I blame the know, pandemic. Unfinished features. Yeah, I think the pandemic has a lot to do with it. It delayed some games, and it also made some companies 
Because uh, when they announced the Xbox Series X and they when they announced the PS5, I remember the announcements were so ambitious. Yeah. So at least said for Xbox, it was a little too ambitious, but they were they were so ambitious, and I think the pandemic just took all the wind out their sails. And then they were next thing you know, they were scrambling just to get the things out and yeah, shortages and it was a, so I th- I think these really took a hit there. Anywho, uh, so that's my bit on this mobile gaming console that may or may not happen from Xbox. Well, some publishers reportedly not sure why they should keep supporting Xbox. That's that's my story. Okay. So reportedly, some third-party video game publishers aren't sure why they should keep making and supporting games for Xbox consoles due to poor sales in Europe. In a new podcast from GameIndustry.biz, the head of the outlet, Chris Dring, explained that while at the 2024 Game Developers Conference, he heard that flatlining Xbox hardware sales in Europe have made some companies question what the point is of continuing to support Microsoft's brand and its various consoles due to a declining audience and lack of growth. Here's a quote. The other thing I heard, I heard it from a very prominent company and one not so prominent was Xbox performance in Europe is just flatlining, said Dring on the podcast. You can follow our monthly coverage in the games market and you can see that Xbox sales are falling and it's been falling throughout last year and it's falling even harder this year. Dring further said that one major company who reportedly released a big game last year said, I don't know why we bothered supporting it. Hmm. Okay. I, I mean, so that's kind of more of an opinion piece feeling thing, but there is like, it's, I guess it's backed in real sales data. The, um, it does, it lines up with a lot of what we've been hearing from, was that Phil Spencer about the, this kind of change in strategy for Xbox. Yeah. Cause I mean, they knew the sales data well before we ever saw it. And this whole this kind of move towards more um, gaming as a service, soft moving more towards software rather than hardware, that's probably d- directly looking at the data that we're res- that these guys are responding to. They're like, hey, hardware is not doing it. Yeah, it feels like people. There's a oh god, I don't want to sound like I'm like ragging on the Xbox here. I promise, I'm I'm like you know I root for these companies. You're not sense. a Sony pony. Yeah, I'm not a Sony pony. Uh, <laughs> I root for these companies in the sense that I don't want, like, companies to go out of business. That's not fun. I don't think, like, we'd win by losing Xbox or something. However, I do think that it seems like this latest cycle of games, it's just been rough for Xbox. From the outset, you know, the Series X and S didn't feel like they differentiated themselves super well Mm -hmm. from the Xbox One and One X. It's just the naming convention is kind of hard to quickly kind of say and wrap your brain around. And the PS5 has, like, an easier just PS5. It's better than the PS4. So that, like, out the gate wasn't good. Um, And then, like, now that it seems like in these recent interviews, we always get these quotes that sort of suggest, like, we're not very confident in our hardware anymore. We Mm kind of just want you to play our software, subscribe to our thing. Which, by the way, Game Pass is a good service. I don't want to, you know, discount that. But I can see where, as a developer, it's, like, a little strange that... You know, it kind of it's like you know Xbox bought up all these studios. They bought Bethesda and stuff like that, and yet like there aren't really games coming out that feel like they are reflecting those purchases. And then people still haven't really been buying the Xbox. I don't know. It's I, I see where there'd be apprehension around developing for it. It reminds me of situations like um, developing for like the PlayStation Vita when that was like a thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. It you know. Why should I develop for, like, the Vita when no one's bought it? So if I make this game and spend a lot of money and, like, years and time and labor making this, and then there's literally not enough people who own a Vita to buy it. Same with the Wii U. The like, Vita was not appreciated during its time. Yeah, I can see why a developer would feel this way. Yeah, I mean, th- it's it's a very tough gaming market right now. Xbox is feeling the brunt. It's it feeling the brunt of it. But, um, like, I said before... uh. Xbox sounds like they are moving in a bit of a different direction. I think we can expect good things from them in the future, whether that's on the hardware or software front. Yeah. 
<laughs> that was such a generic, like, political answer to give. I think we can expect good things from that. No, but I, I, I really do mean that. I've actually, I've really liked Phil Spencer's uh, talk, uh, you know, these little media bites he's been giving us left and right. You know what I like about him? What? He seems self-aware. Oh. Like, he's just like, he's aware of, like, he's not about to sit here and pretend like Xbox is the greatest thing on earth and that, and that that's, like, a given. Because he said in a lot of interviews in the past that, you know, he feels like it's difficult to, like, get people to kind of leave their camps. Mm-hmm. Like, just because you make a better Xbox doesn't mean it'll do better. There are people who are just invested in Sony or Nintendo. I feel like I cut you off. You were saying something. Uh, I I don't even remember anymore. I'm sorry. But the uh, there is a certain awareness that he has. That I feel like that Microsoft in general has around the Xbox. I think they are parting with tradition. I think I said this in a previous pass. I think they're parting with tradition and they are going to make the best moves for their for their company. Like so when I said we can I I think we can be optimistic. I really do mean I I think even more so than Sony. I expect better things from Xbox than I do from PlayStation in the future. That that but that might not mean, you know, newer better hardware. Yeah. Well, I've got one last Xbox story for us. There's more? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there's more. Microsoft publishes new inclusion guide for video game devs. Recommends mm. against creating female characters with, quote, exaggerated body proportions. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. I, mm, I'll, I'll continue. Okay. So, um, basically, Microsoft has what? I... I'm 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 holding my thoughts until I can think of a good way to say them. Okay. Well, uh, anywho, Microsoft asked developers to. Um, oh God, I hate these ads on these websites. Yep, me too. Where it's like you can't like find what you want. To and they're mad at us for running ad blockers. Okay, Microsoft asked developers to watch out for gender stereotypes and exaggerated body proportions. So on their website, where they talk about uh, inclusion and all of this stuff. They say, here's some questions to consider. Are you telling new stories or sharing new perspectives within the product experience? Do mm-hmm. all of your characters and player depictions look the same? What steps have you taken to ensure characters are represented respectfully and authentically? How have you validated assumptions you've made about your audience to check for blind spots or unintended stereotypes? Would you feel proud to show a member of a community how their culture or character is depicted within your experience? How are the wide range of customers depicted within your products, content portfolio, and communications? Um, and are you reinforcing any negative gender stereotypes? So, are you unnecessarily introducing gender and gender barriers into your code or design? Are you creating playable female characters that are equal in skill and ability to their male peers? Are your female characters equipped with clothing and armor that fits their tasks? Do they have exaggerated body proportions? Um, when the story allows, do you show male characters who display a full range of emotions, including joy, sadness, or vulnerability? What percentage of screen time is held by different gender or race identities? Woo! So, heavy one. All right. So, thank, I'm glad you read the whole thing. That did help me uh, collect my thoughts better. Whatever I was going to say at first wasn't going to be helpful and probably would have been clipped in context and still would have been bad. Yeah, let's hear it. I do think these are these are actually great questions to ask after... Um, the initial work has been done on a game. Not like once you've like created and coded it, and not when the game's complete. But I do think when 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 you've designed your characters, when you have a pretty good idea of what you want this game to look like, I think these are important questions to ask. Just because they can just help a game be more inclusive. Cause I think that these are like suggestions, right? These aren't yeah, like these are suggestions. I think any any changes you can make based off the questions here are probably, you know, just better for a game in general. You're not, you're not being forced to, but I do think it helps when people don't feel alienated by a title. Yeah. Mm, okay. So I already know we're in a landmine here just yeah. with this whole topic because there are people who... I got my mind sleeper uh, flags ready. <laughs> yeah. It, there, I know that there, this one's going to like bring out the comments, right? Every mm-hmm. podcast where there's like a story that brings out the comments, people have some things to say. I'm mad that that headline, just like that, that, that headline of so yeah, this, it's polarizing. A, these, these headlines are, lo- are a little loaded. Um, but what do I think? Well, 
To give some background here, I think that it feels like this topic as a whole has gotten uncomfortable now because there is a group of people who want more inclusion in games and there is mm-hmm. a group of people who feel that it's fine already and they feel that the people who want more inclusion or are pushing for it are in some way kind of ruining their games, disrupting, you know, you don't need to fix a good thing. It was fine the way it was. Mm-hmm. Why do we have to have all this diversity in our games? Why do we have to care how women look or feel or whatever about these games? Uh, you know, whatever. It's, I actually think that it's not, like, I agree with you that these guidelines are not nearly as bad as an article with the right headline or wrong headline can Mm -hmm. make them sound. I think a lot of people will see this and be like, wow, Microsoft's gone woke or something like that, right? Microsoft has gone woke. They're trying to force us to to play as like women and black people and I don't want to... I don't really think that that's the case here. These do seem like these are just sort of like questions that they posit and you can ignore them. Like developers aren't forced to do these things. And even if they consider these questions, I mean, they might consider them and come to the conclusion that their game is fine. You're right. And they release it like nothing, you know. So I don't think that just having these here is like a bad thing. If it kind of makes people be a little more considerate, great. Um, Exaggerated body proportions is a tricky one to talk about, though. Oh, yeah. So, uh, here's what I'll say about it. I think historically games have certainly done not the best job of depicting female characters in, like, you know, RPGs, fighting games, whatever, like, anime. We're it, not saying it was garbage. We're just saying it could have been better. Like, you know, you're used to kind of, like, the exaggerated body proportions It's a common thing, right? Yeah. It is. Um... I don't want to sound like I'm nitpicking this or, like, trying to just be, like, a smartass. But I do wonder, like, where the line is drawn with stuff like that. Because, like, what, cause what is an exaggerated, exaggerated body, body proportion, proportion exactly? Yeah. I think some there are there are some examples out there in the gaming world that you could say, okay, sure, this one is extreme. I think we can all agree. But then... But like, if you dr- dial back the sli- the sliders even slightly, it's like, well, now is it exaggerated? Yeah, like it's interesting because we'll take you know women's breasts in games, mm-hmm. right? You can have a character who's you know like big titty mommy milker, whatever. <laughs> this is just it's fan service. I get it. Like people like that, but it's good not, old Ivy Soul Caliber. But it's like not really a great depiction of women, and I think most people know that it's you know they know what they're seeing. However, they're you know. Like you said, as you scale back the sliders, there might be like a woman who actually looks like that. And so is it at that point exaggerated body proportions or or is it just or is this now just kind of a uh, an, a, 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 an, a an extreme that can exist in real life? Yeah. And it's like, again, I I'll kind of end it there because I don't want to be pedantic about this. Right. Like, I know that there are people who will engage in this sort of argument in, in bad faith and just sort of say, well, technically, there could be a woman with a. Size so triple Z bra, like okay, great. Like I mean, but, I mean, and I'm pretty sure it's going on right now in the live chat. Yeah, shout I mean, out to really the like premiere. This, so I don't want to make it sound like I'm just trying to say that, but I do wonder when people say like exaggerated body proportions, where they draw the line. I know like a game that's come under some fire recently, in a good way mostly, is Stellar Blade, <laughs> where people are like, oh, you know, they just, you know, she's like an, an object, she's a sex object, whatever. Like they made her hot, so the jiggle physics, this and that, um. But, like, the character in Stellar Blade is based off a real, like, real-world model. Yeah. So, you know, it's it, is it a, a harmful stereotype if it's based on, like, a person who is real? It's such a rough area. I think yeah. th- this, um, this story made me think of two different games, and both from the PS1 era. Uh, Final Fantasy VII and Tomb Raider, uh, Lara Croft and Tifa Lockhart. Uh, we can, I think, everyone can agree that they were quite top heavy in those PS One day, days, yeah. but those were also with like PS One graphics. So to some degree, it's like uh, kind of a, it was the times, you know. We'll, we'll let it, we'll let it go. Yeah. Both games have had modern remakes since. Now in Tomb Raider, we've we've seen them the modern Tomb Raider games. They went ahead and uh. They, they kind of modernized their Lara Croft design. Not nearly as extreme in the, like the chest department, you know? Yeah. And 
I think a lot of people still found Tomb Raider to be a lots of fun. It was still a great game. Her design did not hurt those games. In Final Fantasy VII, they did the same thing with Tifa's design and remake, but I but um, the developers have since kind of yeah. reversed course in the uh, in Rebirth. Yeah, they made her breast bigger. Yeah, they, they, they actually that, enlarged yeah. Tifa for the second game to be more in line with her PS One model, and like what so. Was interesting about that was that was like by fan request. Yeah, so or kind of fan demand. Yeah, we demanded. Like some will call it regressive, but I don't think. They're even they're wrong to model the character based off of how it was modeled originally. They didn't have to, but does it make Tifa look less realistic? Yes. Do the players care? Mm, <laughs> I don't think they do. Yeah, it's a fun it's a fun conversation too because I think like some games are just I think some games kind of just set out to be like. They're, they shamelessly are what they are. And I think the yeah. players know going into the experience what it is. That Some like games are going to go further in the fantasy direction than others. Yeah. And will that will, will, will that alienate someone You know, in the millions and billions of people on this planet? Sure, it'll alienate someone. But not every game is for every person. That doesn't change the fact that I think that these questions are still worth considering. It's always worth considering. You know, I do want to actually quickly go over a couple of the questions around it. Um, are you reinforcing any negative gender stereotypes? I think that's sort of something that's, broadly speaking, is worth a bit of a talk for, like, any game. I think in Western, or early Western RPGs, I th- I remember, like, I, don't, I can't specifically name the games, but I remember, like, female characters... Being like being weaker, yeah, just being depicted as like inferior to play as that's like often a thing, you know. I know in a lot of games, like I think of say Sonic Adventure or something, Sonic Adventure 2, like you can play as Amy, but she's just slower and like can't do things like in some of these games. And so, like, I think if that had been made today, that wouldn't be the case. Mm-hmm. And I think that's like for the best. I don't, I don't really think there's like a huge benefit in being like, yeah, like the girl characters just suck and are objectively worse. That's not really. I mean, I don't see a benefit the, uh, to that. Or the the uh, the wonderful RPG mechanic of you equi- equi- equipping stronger armor on male characters puts more armor, more armor on them, but then yeah. you put you put stronger armor on the female characters, and they're actually wearing less. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I so I think for stuff like that, that's something that's like an easy fix, right? Like you should. Like, it doesn't have to be that. It way. doesn't have to be that way, and I think that if you want your character to look that way, that's totally like in line. Like you know, a lot of RPGs now let you kind of like in Final Fantasy, it's like glamouring your. Yeah, armor. you can put whatever armor on them you and still take it off. Yeah, you can wear whatever and just have it appear to be other armor. That's fine because then it's like on the player's hand; mm-hmm. they can kind of choose. Um, but I do think that like if it's the default armor is like oh wow entire her entire legs and midriff are just totally and like her arms are all just exposed what would she wouldn't fight in that at least it, well, at least it wouldn't be safe to yeah it certainly wouldn't be safe so uh they also ask you know when the story allows do you show male characters displaying a full range of emotions of joy sadness or vulnerability this is kind of a big one that one's tough like i know you know there's a whole conversation around you know male kind of emotional stuntedness and kind of guys you know just don't show emotion hold in your anger or like only show anger and like hold in sadness or joy because like, you know, you're not kind of able to express those things. You're not taught that you can express mm-hmm. those things. So yeah, I mean, I think like that's a good guideline. Have some oh, male characters with some range. A weird thing, a weird thing. Uh, Cause you know, I, I always talk about cyberpunk cause I enjoy the games. The, uh, I was, I, I always liked the uh, character V's range of emotions in cyberpunk, but I realize that might have been because V can be played as both a like a male and a female character. So like because of that it felt they you know they they wrote V to have the same exact like emotions regardless of which character you play. And I, I think that really helped because we did, we you got to have a male V character who still very much felt the gravity of everything happening around him. He was sometimes he was at an all time high, sometimes at an all time low, and he still was able to emote that regardless of which gender you played as. Yeah. Now, people's response to this news, 
has not been great. I'm not surprised. And I'm not surprised. I think I think there's some interesting points raised, but I think that it's important not to like just read the headline with this one. As we've established, it's kind of it's a loaded headline. That right? is, that like, is. You know, uh, Microsoft tells people not to objectify women in their games. They're going woke, this and that. Like, that's relax. if you just read the headline, it gets easy to feel that way. I think <clears> that <throat> there are some good points raised, though. Um, someone said, "I couldn't care less if fictional women are in realistic equipment or not." Uh, personally, as a woman who plays games, I prefer them not in hideous full suits of armor. That's just me, though. I'm also sick of it always being only how the women look that's a problem and needs fixing. So that's kind of a a different stance on it that I hadn't fully considered is like, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe you, it kind of gets back to like that whole glamouring thing, like you're being able to change how your armor and stuff looks by choice, even though it it can have the better stats. Some people want like their woman to be in full suits of armor, just like the male characters are. Other people want her to like, you know, be in something that's like, we'll say skimpier or maybe more like conventionally attractive. But I think that's as long as it's a choice, they, that's uh, probably the key there. But they also seem to posit the the idea that there can be over sexualized male characters as well in that comment. That's true. I think uh, a lot of people, would, we don't scrutinize male characters to the same degree at all. Cause I mean, I, but I guess my issue is I never like, like played devil may cry and was like, is Dante too sexy? Like, could he be wearing, covering up a little bit more? Like, is it, or like... Yeah, it's really tricky because, like... Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, know, I, I know how it feels to like, go into these sorts of topics because... Anyway, okay, I'll just say what I have to say about you wanna, it. You want a uh, mind flag? You know, mark <laughs> the minds before you start? Um, I think it's just because people only really seem to see women as, like, sex objects. Like, men just don't really get viewed in that way. And I think it's a, at least speaking about games specifically, mm. like, it's kind of media in general, but we'll focus more on games. Is like usually, it almost feels like women are like, when they're added to a game, it's like a, an extra, an after, not an afterthought, but it's like, okay, the female version of this character is like the sexy version of whatever the male character looks like. That's kind of been a convention that a lot of games have had. And so I think it's why we, have gotten the way we are where like you just don't see the male character as particularly sexy like regardless and that's not even like a you know i mean maybe it's well if more men are playing the games then they probably don't see the male character as attractive or not they just unless are, they like, do playing them it's not that you can't but just that like it's probably less likely right like maybe that's what it is i don't i don't know you want a mind flag I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but like, I'm trying to be. I mean, I'm trying to handle the topic with as much like, <sighs> like it's, it's, it's like. I wonder what are we arguing? I wonder what they're arguing for. It's like, a should tough the, one. Should it's male a, characters be able? Sorry, you go ahead. Because uh, I always, for me, I always think about these things as, as like personal anecdotes. Because I look at a game like Street Fighter, mm-hmm. where uh, the Street Fighter certainly has over sexualized female characters. But I think we could probably also argue the males are actually to pretty much the same degree. I mean, do do we we don't have giant bulges in Street Fighter? But I mean, like th- those, it feels like you get like hyper masculinity and hyper femininity in that series. Yeah, I was gonna say Street Fighter is a good example of just everyone's kind of sexy. Like they like, just they kind of go ham. Yeah, I also think that like these days with like the really realistic graphics we have in most of these games, like. Every, like, a lot of just by default, a lot of characters are just sexier. Like you know, like everyone just kind of looks more. They can always go that extra mile to really make the characters look and feel alive and like realistic. Because and then the word realistic is always going to be a bit of a uh, issue with me. Because like, what do you when? Because everyone says like you should portray the characters more realistically. I'm like, do you mean realistically? Because if a character can resemble a human being, but they look the way that they do, like the Stellar Blade character, then aren't they still still realistic? Do you yeah. in, do you instead mean look more averagely? Because yeah, look more like the mean. Do we really want our characters to look like us? Like. When you really think about it, <laughs> Alec is saying that the humans are ugly. Well, like I know what you mean. Do, do we want like true. A, a lot squash of... shaped and boxy characters? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. That, that's actually so. That that's a great point because uh, 
a lot of like guys, girls, I think this applies to everybody. Like you probably wouldn't want your video game character to look like, so like plain and ordinary. Like, like what kind of if supposed to look <laughs> ideal? I All guess. right, I'm taking it a step further. <laughs> what if every time you played a game, your character had to look like you? And I mean, look like you in every, every way. way. Like any like insecurity that you have around like your face shape right. or like your weight or your height or like your hair or you, skin or just you can't argue that it's not realistic but would you, you want, want to play that <laughs> yeah that'd be it. so it's like I, it's like video game characters in general are gonna have to kind of i don't have to but typically will just look more idealized mm-hmm. like i don't know I, what do people think I don't know. I don't what, know. What, I'm handing this That's one off to one. the crowd. Yeah, you guys let us know. <laughs> I'm sure people, if they're like listening to the premiere, they've probably already been arguing in these comments. Is it, you know, what do you think about these sort of guidelines or considerations that Microsoft has set out? Do you think that this is only going to make games worse? Do you think this actually makes games better? I err on the side of thinking that... These are good considerations to have. I think they're fine, you know. I think these are good considerations to have. It just kind of depends on the game. I don't think it's like a woke political correctness thing or anything. I think it's more like, you know, you should just kind of ask these questions. I really wish Watch Dogs would have abided by that question and not made all the bad guys in Watch Dogs 1 black and Mexican. Yeah, that was that was. Yeah, maybe they need uh, to they need to take a step in the future and read the stuff for themselves. I, I know. I, I think it could be fine. It it could be fine. Yeah, maybe they could use what is it? What is the term that they're saying online? DEI. Yeah. I, do not mention that. I have things we can't say on pod. All right. Well, yeah. Anywho, um, that was an interesting story. I think that'll probably be the most commented one. Yeah, I think so. so. Let's move on to something else. You got cool. something for us? Yeah. Oh, well, this one's not gaming rage. You got any more gaming ones? I don't. All I right. All the games. So, a uh, trailer came out last week for Star Wars: The Acolyte. Okay. So it's a live action Disney Plus Star Wars show. And while well, before you roll your eyes, like another one, like yes, it's another one, but this one's different. It's set in the High Republic era of Star Wars. See, Star Wars is a large and long universe with a timeline. And the High Republic era is well before anything we've ever seen in the movies and TV shows. So we can have at least 50 more pro- uh, projects just from this timeline alone. Well, tell me about the thing first. Like, what? When, so, it's, it's a show. It's a show, The Acolyte. The trailer premiered to the most views any uh, Disney Plus show has ever gotten. Really? I'm surprised. Okay. People like it? No. It also has one known. of the worst like-to-dislike ratios we'd ever seen, to the point where if you look at that trailer right now, they have been disabled. You cannot see the likes and dislikes. So what is it? What's the problem? So most people will tell you the problem is that Disney is killing the Star Wars brand that they are just the churning out just too many projects. I've heard that they're going said. after they're 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 going after literally anything they can make a show or a movie about and they're just attacking it. Yeah. What they're what many of them are actually upset with is the the very heavy inclusion of people of color color. and like women dei you might say yeah yeah that's everyone's favorite new little buzzword i hate it by the way um yeah so not that i hate i don't hate that there there are like characters of color i hate the use of like dei as a thinly veiled insult we need to stop using that acronym because that's gonna make me say things that then we'll have to like cut out the pod Okay, well, let's look at it more so from... You actually know about Star Wars and, like, mm-hmm. watch it. Do you think that this show looks promising? The, the, Acolyte, the Acolyte trailer actually looks perfectly fine. If you're a Star Wars fan, it has what you want. It has Jedi, it, like, multiple Jedi. This isn't... Because we've, we've dealt with so long with the... Uh, 
the Jedi Temple has been destroyed. The movie only ever has like one or two Jedi at best. Now nah, there's actually a ton of them in this, mm-hmm. and there's not. And there's the Sith. You know, the Jedi's antagonist. You were, you're, you can expect a very action heavy lightsaber and force wielding heavy show, which should be what a Star Wars fan would like. Um, most Star Wars fans are just a little like tired. But hey, look, we're we're still here. Yeah. If if we t- if we kind of look at the acolyte in a vacuum off of just the trailer they showed us, this should be fine. This should be like people should be excited for it. They're just not. They're, they're not. They're but gonna... that's because of a lot of external things fatigue, outside of this Star show. Wars fatigue. What was the show last year? The the show last year, well, the, the few shows last year. I mean, because they did um there were two. <sighs> We who, got another girl? season of The Mandalorian. Okay, we so had um, Ahsoka. 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 That's okay. Interesting. So they're just, they really are like. They pump them out. They pump them out. I. So I don't like Star Wars. And I'm, I'm not saying I hate Star Wars. Saying I do not know about like, Star Wars, so I don't we like We just haven't it. properly indoctrinated you into it. Luckily, I heard they're about they to re-show will. all the movies. They're and also so, going to be re-showing Spider-Man this year. They're going to be putting all those movies back in theaters. You you're, and you're going to see all of that, so that's that's cool. That's cool. Well, anyway... Um, I don't like the way you just move past that. <laughs> I, I don't know that much about Star Wars, so I can't say whether or not this trailer looks good or bad, but I think that I'd be mostly happy to just have more media in the world that I like. I know that that's a a broad thing to say because there's plenty of examples of that strictly going wrong. I mean, there are a lot of Star Wars fans who are happy just to get any amount of Star Wars content. There, but there there has been a lot, and a lot. it do, it does it it feels a bit like the quality has suffered a bit. I heard good things about like the Mandalorian and Ahsoka. They, you did, and they were good. It's just. We're co- but we're still coming off of the the questionable trilogy that was uh, Ray's time yeah. as our main character. It, it, you know, that feels like that's what it is. That little trilogy of movies seems like the one thing I hear people bitch about the most with Star Wars is those three movies. People, they say, she's this, she's that. These movies run this. They took this character's character arc. They run Poe. They run Finn. Like, she make no sense. It wasn't whatever. Dog Water. Was it the worst Star Wars trilogy? Pro- probably, probably, and that's not me. I don't even hate them, but I yeah, the weakest one. It maybe. does feel like the weakest one we've had yet. But it feels like the waves of that have still been felt today. Yes, and it's odd because like didn't the last of those movies come out like four like four years ago or something? Star Wars like, fans are old. Time is ephemeral. <laughs> like well, because oh. yeah, I gotta think about it. a lot of Star Wars fans. You know, they were there when the very first movies came out. And then there are some fans who weren't there when the first movies came out, but they were there when the prequels came out. And so we've been in the game as far as Star Wars fans for so long. Those movies are still fresh to us. (laughs) Those those movies happened yesterday. I do think like Star Wars is one of the examples of it. You know, like some series of games and movies kind of feel like they're able to just they're very like flexible and like can kind of just, they move forward fast and stay like progressive all the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas like other ones feel like they're always competing with their past. Star Wars is one of those things where it's like, no matter what new star Wars like property comes out, it feels like though though, that original trilogy and all that stuff, like it's always going to be compared to that. And it's, I I can't tell what defines whether or not like a, a franchise is tied to its past or not. Because like uh, they all hard. sort of seem to be, but like it's different for some. This is a very unique situation. No other franchise has done what Star Wars has. I think the MCU is moving towards something like that. I think in uh, fifteen years we'll have literally the same conversation about Marvel as we're having about Star Wars right now. And it already feels like that's beginning. Yeah, I, that's why. That's why I mentioned so. it. It feels like we're getting the beginnings of that with the MCU, but. Like most franchises that came out in any type of close relative closeness to Star Wars, you know they 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 came and they went. They stopped. You know they might have lasted a while and then they then they stopped. Star Wars is the only one that's like 
hey, bro, we were around in the 80s. We'll be around in the 2040s. We're just going to be here always, forever, watching. <sighs> well, hopefully the show can be good. I mean, yeah, I mean what the trailer looks about, good. Like, all of these black characters What's crazy your is, media and ruining it. What's crazy is when, when I watched the trailer, I didn't think much of it. Mm-hmm. I think because characters reminded me of like myself and people that I know, the trailer just felt very natural. Yeah. But like I also didn't like pick out every non black character to have an issue with either. It just felt it felt like a, it just felt like a like interesting, good trailer. Did I love another example of those sideways dreads? Yeah, everybody's favorite the, black like, hairstyle. I didn't love that. They looked crispy. I don't know what that was about, but they look, they look dry. I, you know, I'm just saying, like maybe that was the context of the scene. Like They're he hadn't crusty. he hadn't moisturized them in a while, but they they just, they just look a little dry in that scene. But um, I don't know the act like that. I, if keeping all the outside stuff out of it, it looks interesting enough. Interesting enough. It looks like it's gonna have action. It, lo- it just looks like a good time. Hmm. And we might as well get used to it because this is the very first piece of video media in the uh, set in the High Republic arc. When there's been, there's actually been many books now in the last few years, so um, we're gonna be here for a while. I'll see you guys when we're eighty. Cool. I'd love to hear people's thoughts on this as well. I don't watch Star Wars, but I Yet. will be following along with the news around this show, and I'll hear from you and most likely Larry what the takeaway is. Cool. Well, if you don't, do you have any other serious stories? No. You wanna have a little fun? I've got some bullshit stories okay. that I brought. Wait, along. where's it from? They're from like mostly reputable sources. Okay, okay. I think. No more CBR. Well, okay, here's one last, like, kind of just interesting fluff. No, it's not fluff, it's a big deal. Ten year old hailed as messy of chess after beating Magnus Carlson. I don't know how many of you guys follow chess. I kind of have heard a little bit more about it in the last year or two. The 10-year-old prodigy Faustino Oro has been hailed as the messy of chess after beating Magnus Carlsen in a bullet game. So, Magnus Carlsen... Do you know anything about like Magnus yeah. Carlsen this whole thing? Okay, he's long held the number one position in uh, FIDE's chess rankings. Um, and some people feel that he's unbeatable. On the rare occasion, it's uh, he's known to take a defeat. On March 23rd, Carlsen was beaten by a 10-year-old Argentinian chess prodigy in just 38 seconds. So, uh, stream live on Faustino Oro's YouTube channel. He streamed himself playing Bullet Chess on chess.com and found himself queued up against Carlson. As the game rapidly progressed, Oro found himself with an advantage towards the end game, and he said, If I lose this, I can retire from chess. Oro would go, go on to win, with Carlson retiring from the game as he was put in an unwinnable position. So, um... I think that has a lot to do with the uh, format. I know Bullet Chess is not... Your typical chess game. How does bullet chess work exactly? I'm not sure the nuances. The I don't know my differences too well, but my understanding is uh, bullet chess is a much faster pace game. Yeah. Um. I'm, I just looked it up. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So bullet chess. The first time chess players hear the term bullet chess, many uh, many negative th- uh, things that come to mind. What is bullet chess? So it is. Time controls are between five and ten minutes per player, so it's faster than blitz chess. Oh, so, so this is the paced. fastest way to play chess, I guess. Yeah, um, chess.com heralded him as the Messi of chess, comparing him to the Argentinian legend. Argentine legend, sorry. However, despite the celebrations from the community, a few were still skeptical of Oro's victory over Carlson. What's all the hype? Carlson would still probably beat him in a long classical chess match, especially if it's 14 or 16 games, said Grandmaster Anish Giri in response to Oro's feat. That, that is an interesting thing. Like, you know, I guess he, he took one. Yeah. And obviously chess is the sort of game where, like, winning once is not the biggest deal in the world so much as, like, can you win a series, particularly over, like, you know, a long time established, like, player i think it's would like probably beat you like it's like overtime. matching up in the laker against the lakers in the playoffs like all right you gotta win a best of seven yeah and that's actually like that does speak to why like a lot of championships and stuff are kind of best of seven best of five whatever like even Yu Gi Oh's best of three and there are people who want that to be best of five anything to kind of remove the chance of a fluke Mm-hmm. The chance of like RNG that you really want the better player to win. Now, there's not to say that this kid wasn't the better player in that moment. 
uh, I mean, that that's such an intense format of chess. I mean, may, like it could have been an off day, but may, maybe in that format of chess, Magnus is not unbeatable. I don't know. I don't know his history like that. Yeah. Well, um, I've got some food stories. I don't want to eat right now. I got some food stories. I'm not hungry. Have you ever wondered why Papa John's gives you a pepper with your pizza? Oh, yeah, the pepper uh, chino thing. Yeah, do you know why that is? So you can put it on your pizza? Well, here's the real reason behind the tradition. Okay. Prepare yourself. I'm not. Uh, so, um, okay, so you're wondering why Papa John's puts a pepper on the side of your pizza. The reason, the real reason comes from a truly heartwarming tale. The little pepper that you get with your pizza has become a staple of Papa John's, and whilst it's a delicious addition to any leftover crust, the reason it's there is for more than just flavor. John Schnatter, the founder of Papa John's Pizza, started off his career as a dishwasher in his dad's bar. When they started serving pizzas to customers, they would always put a pepperon, pepperoncino inside every Chino. bar. Pepperon ch- this mildly spicy addition became John's signature in the food he served, and he wanted to carry on the tradition when he opened up his own chain of restaurants. Um, he founded Papa John's Pizza in 1984, creepy year, when he converted a broom closet in the back of his father's bar into a pizza kitchen. He even sold his car to purchase $1,600 worth of used pizza equipment and began selling pizzas to the customers. So yeah, it's a pepperoncino or banana pepper um, that has a zesty and spicy flavor. And so he does it to, um, I guess, like in memoriam of when he started there. Paul, did you just answer a question that no one was asking? It's an article in Dexerto. <laughs> I guess Answering we know a question now. That nobody adds, asked I guess we know now. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, do you are you a fan of like the the pepper with the pizza? Sure, I think it's cool. I've never eaten mine. I, I don't I usually like put the much. juice on my uh, my pizza and crust. The juice? Yeah. Oh, you like squeeze you the squeeze pepper? And, oh, okay, I don't usually. So that was kind of an interesting thing. I always wondered why they like why they specifically would give the pepper. So and no one else does it. it it's a, it's a, it's a thing. Uh, some people love it. Some people hate it. Well, here's something else fun, food-related. Chick-fil-A testing out six pizza styles. So Chick-fil-A is going to be serving you pizza. Yeah, speaking of pizza. Hmm. And also, they're removing the no antibiotics ever label from their chicken. So that chicken about to have some antibiotics in it. Yeah, so Chick-fil-A will begin using antibiotics in its chicken again. The fast food chain (laughs) announced the news in a statement on Thursday, which uh, will overturn a 2014 pledge that they'd made to use only antibiotic-free chicken. They made that pledge in 2014, and just 10 years later, they're already like, you know what? Nah. Uh, yeah, so Chick-fil-A maintains that it will continue to use only high-quality meat and that its chicken remains real white breast meat with no added fillers, artificial preservatives, or steroids, and no added hormones. But there will be antibiotics. Um, the move comes nearly a year after Tyson announced plans to begin using a no-antibiotics-important-to-human-medicine label on its chicken and other food items. Similarly, Chick-fil-A will now make a shift towards that same label, but will use only antibiotics intended for animals to treat sick chickens. I don't want chicken, a chicken from a slick chicken, all right? Y- y- give me the healthy chickens. Just, so, just let those die. Well, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I don't actually eat that much Chick-fil-A, but I do like it when I have it. Um, except on I, Sundays, I right? probably, <laughs> except on Sundays. Um, I probably would not have like noticed or cared if I hadn't read this article. If I'm being I didn't know they honest. didn't have antibiotics so, in their chicken to begin with. So I mean, I hate. To, I'm just gonna be real about it. I, I'm probably still gonna eat. Man. But for those people who are really um, particular about, you know, but I, you know, what's in your I know this antibiotics and Popeyes chicken. I ate a pop, he's a Popeyes chicken the other day, and I flew for a little bit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Chick-fil-A is also gearing up to roll out a new menu of pizzas um, with the Atlanta-based company's test kitchen, Little Blue Menu, already serving up six new pizza options. The menu includes two pizzas topped with chicken nuggets. That's the Chick-fil-A Chick-fil-A pizza pie and buff, Buffalo Ranch pizza pie, as well as three standard pizzas, cheese, pepperoni, and meat and vegetables. It's a strange thing to get at a Chick-fil-A, but power to them, I guess. Would you get like a Chick Fil A pizza? Um, like no. an average. You just because I, I have the pizzas that I eat and I like, and 
I don't feel any need to add any more to that. I think I'll try one out. No, you're not allowed to try out any of them because <laughs> you still like bringing Little Caesars around here. I think it'll taste better than Little Caesars. I don't trust you. Well, at any rate, um, what so- which flavor sounds the best? Like Chick Fil A pizza pie or Buffalo Ranch pizza pie? Pepperoni. I think I would just get pepperoni as well. And at I, that I point, you might as well go to a, pl- a place you know and like already. Yeah. So, cool. I mean, I don't know. That's always an interesting food story. I've got one more. What you got? Do you have any more stories? No. Okay, cool. Last food story. 7-Eleven unveils new hot dog flavored drink. Turn the stream off. Turn, turn it all off. Yeah. This I don't is- want to talk about this now. Yeah, let me let me see. Uh, what is the, what is there to see? Well, I had it pulled. It wouldn't pull up, so I'm trying to find um, the hot dog. Because this sounds disgusting, like in yeah, a spiritual sense. Here. Where's the story? Where did you, you harmed my soul with that headline. Okay, Seven Eleven announces new hot dog flavored drink, but some fans question if the product is real. So, um, is it edge real? Like they the did a convenience fake store announced Wednesday that customers can try a new collection of seven select sparkling waters. The collection include new flavors like lemon lime, green apple, sweet orange, and hot dog. Here's a picture of the hot dog sparkling water. That looks like Photoshop. I mean, it could be. Um, the Big Bite Hot Dog Sparkling Water combines the delicious and mouthwatering experience of 7 Eleven's iconic Big Bite Hot Dog into one refreshing beverage. Ketchup and mustard included. Gone are the days of alternating bites of a hot dog with sips of a beverage. Now those in the go can swap the bun for bubbles, a news release said. Why are we making this fake product? (laughs) Is it Um, April 1st? Well, it's funny you mention that. While guests can try the lemon, lime, green apple, and sweet orange sparkling water at select 7-Eleven stores, the hot dog flavored drink is expected to hit shelves on April 1st. Also, Uh. on April Fool's Day. So I'm pretty sure this is not real, but I did think it was just sort of a fun gag product. You're gonna oh, get your big bite hot dog sparkling water. Sure, I'm gonna I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it uh, on, on April February 29th. That existed this year. Yeah, next year though. Oh, not next year. I'm gonna get it on February 29th next year. It sounds disgusting. It actually, makes me want to puke just hearing it. The but. very thought of it churn, makes my stomach churn. I'm so glad to hear that it's just an April Fool's joke. Yeah, it'd be really awful if it was real. In this day and age, you can't be sure what they'll make into food and try and put in your system. I would rather have those like Yu-Gi-Oh food things they do in Japan, like the Hungry Burger. Oh, yeah, yeah. The burger that eats you, too. Yeah, but maybe not the Winged Dragon of Ramen again. That wasn't the no, best. the Winged Dragon of Ramen was not a win. It was not... All right, guys, here's the pot of greed. Wow. <laughs> guys, if you couldn't hear him, he said, here's the pot of greed. We're about to answer some questions. Yeah, let's uh, let's answer some questions from the viewers. Remember, you guys can submit these into the Google form. Somebody informed me in the comments. That they informed had, you about the form? Yeah, they did. They did. I had written um, like like on the form. It says, like, what is your question for the pot of greed? But I had it written as like, what is your question? Is your question for the pot of greed? Like I had it written. To wow. You got to stop letting AI write these things for you. I really should. Actually, AI wouldn't have made the mistake. Chat human GBT. error. Yeah. Human error, not AI error. Chat GBT wrote that. But thank you guys for submitting those. Remember, you can always submit them to the link in the form below. All right. Let's see what it is that these people are asking about today. So. Hmm. Should Konami reprint other sets like Magician's Force or Light of Destruction for the 25th anniversary? Oh, okay. I think I remember We know we're going to be in the 25th anniversary for another like two and a half years, so why not? Yeah, it seems like with the 25th anniversary continuing, I would not mind some other iconic sets getting the reprints. The- I think that probably only maybe the like the big ones, like, the Magi- like Magician's Force would probably be like a good one to do. But Legacy of Darkness. Yeah, Legacy even of if I'm the only one who wants one. it, I think that they should probably continue from some of the old stuff because people tend to have more fond memories towards that. But I wouldn't mind something like Legacy of or Light of Destruction as well. Phantom Darkness could be fun. They feel iconic too. Um, how well would they sell though? I'll buy some. But how well would they sell? Like in they'll general, sell well with me. Would, you think people would be? I feel like as far as getting like more casual fans to buy like re-released old products, the first three sets, cool. Anything beyond that, I don't know if they'll have the same nostalgia for it. 
I, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm inclined to agree. I think it'd be a bit of a risk on Konami's part to release more of these classic sets because we see in our card shop, as it is, like, there's still unsold packs of, like, LOB, mm. Metal Raiders, Phantom uh, Pharaoh Servant. So I think Konami would probably be, like, hesitant to release something like this. It feels difficult. Now, you could probably put it into some sort of, like, a package box, like a legendary collection maybe that helps a little bit with some good promos maybe yeah throwing some nice promos and like kind of it could be the hidden edison product so to speak where like you know people kind of want edison product but it's hard to really like make an edison product because it's such a niche well format. in this case it'll be goat i guess well i mean they, in that case that would be sort of goat or goat adjacent but like if they wanted to do it with like a light of destruction oh right. they could do like you know the duelist genesis like the first Five five Ds. Which one has Magical Android? <laughs> I think Magical Android actually comes in the Duelist Genesis. Oh, okay. I think it's the first. Yeah, because it was one of the really early Tinkers. It was one of the first like two five D sets. Yeah. So you could like toss a couple of those early five D sets in and just call it like Legendary Collection, like five Ds thing, whatever. And like it's basically just a reprint thing for Edison products. But there's a plane going overhead. If you guys can like hear that in the background, apologies. But yeah, um. It could kind of be like a shadow drop Edison mm -hmm. reprints esque thing. And I just I still don't know how it'd sell. I don't know. I don't think it would. I mean, it, it would take some really good marketing. Some really good marketing. Yeah. Um. Cool. Well, here, anyways, here's my question. What you got? Do you prefer brand new archetypes, or would you rather have support for older legacy ones? So this is just for my opinion, right? Just whatever I prefer, not what I think is the best for the game. Yeah, it's what you prefer. I prefer support for older archetypes, but I'm also an old head boomer, so that's actually just what's expected like, what of me. What do you mean by that? Because, you know, I pl I've played this game for many, many years. I've fallen out of favor with the modern game, hmm. so new archetypes are less appealing to me, but the old archetypes I love... That's that's that that's, that that makes me want to play Yu-Gi-Oh, you know. Yeah. The one exception being the, the uh, sarcophagus of light archetype that that that's new and I like it. New. Um, I I agree with you. I think I I kind of like older archetypes getting new support over just introducing new ones. But I do know that new archetypes have to exist for like the game. No, this to is kind your. Of move this is for you. So here's what my happy medium is that I like. Wow. And I miss when they did this. Uh, I miss when the spinoff sets like Dark Saviors and like the Infusion Enforcers and stuff. If you remember, like kind of the early days of these. Oh yeah. Well, where it's they been would a do while. the thing where like it would be like one new archetype and like mm -hmm. two old ones or kind of vice versa. Yeah. Because, like, nowadays when, like, a Valiant Smashers or a Wild Survivors comes out, it's just three new archetypes. Yep, three new ones. I kind of liked when it was like, oh, okay, vampires get support here, but then also they introduce fur hires mm -hmm. and, like, Sky Strikers. So that was kind of cool. It felt like a nice mix. The truth is, though, Yu-Gi-Oh! already does a good job of juggling these two. Like, every new set has... Everything. Like, new stuff and old stuff. So, like, I don't think that there's, like, a particularly a problem but i think they just maybe just curious about what but our if you're just curious about my perspective, were, so. i do think that like support for older archetypes will probably perk up more ears than new ones and on average so i, I kind of like so. the older stuff yeah i'm digging in the pot looking for a question got one yep. here we go all right what do they have Thoughts on an open world MMORPG for Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh. I do you know okay, there's an old Yu-Gi-Oh game that I really liked. Um well, I think it, it got a sequel too, you know. It's um do you remember the Sacred Cards? No. For game okay. Yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh the Sacred Cards, I think it was on Game Boy Advance and it had a, a sequel which I think is Rush of Destruction. But basically, they're these, like, they play a lot. They're, they kind of remind me of, like, Pokemon or other over-the-top, like, kind of top-down RPGs with, like, sprites. You actually played as a character, and, like, Yugi and Joey and other kind of Battle City characters were in the story. And, like, you walked around Battle City and, like, dueled, talked talk to people, challenged people. That was always the coolest thing to me. 
And it reminds me of like a time when Yu-Gi-Oh games kind of were trying out things like that. Now, this person posits an MMO, which I guess I'll get into in a second, but like the blueprint's there. Even some of the 5Gs, 5Gs, five, five 5Ds games and the DS also did, I think, something sort of like a Pokemon-esque overworld. I mean, that's uh, what you're describing there is uh, something that I like about, I like about uh, like trading card video games when they do do it. They don't always do it, but I do like that sort of thing. I always, I always think about the Duel Masters card game on the PS2 as being mm-hmm. my preferred way to play a Yugi, I mean, a uh, card game, video game. But as far as an MMO or MMORPG goes, that's different. That's a, um, that's a that huge sounds tough. I mean, it's funny because like when you already just off the bat, there's a lot of work involved in making an RPG. Yeah. And there's a lot of work involved in making a card game, like simulator game, like a master duel of magic arena. So you're already having to kind of like tape those two together where it's like, you know, you kind of have an overworld, an RPG system and characters and, you know, you can move around. And then like when you challenge someone, it transitions to like, a different engine that's like you know playing the the card game, but like, and then you add like the trials of like making and maintaining an MMO on top of that. And while it's certainly a perfect like match made in heaven, man, that would be. I don't think it is. I think it's like a horribly flawed concept. I don't think huh? you can play the Yu Gi Oh card game in an MMORPG. Okay, I don't. How do you mean? I, I, so I I just don't think this can really work. When you any MMO you've ever played. Uh, do they ha- they don't sling cards right typically like your battles and encounters don't take the same amount of time as a duel oh i get what you mean so even though it would kind of be like a pvp style thing like you can walk up to people and challenge them would you like have the you know 15 20 30 minutes yeah it would to just fair to do the duel? as long as far as like how modern yu gi oh is played it would take even if even in classic Yu Gi Oh, this could really like that could go. So you think the way yeah the system wouldn't work because of like how much time it takes for mm-hmm. engagement? Because mm-hmm. like you know MMO, MMOs are always like grind fests, and usually you you know you repeat the same actions over and over again to build up some type of experience and get stuff. But like playing Yu Gi Oh like that, I do it on Master Duel every day. Yeah, no, I but know. I know what you mean. <laughs> it, it's it's kind of it's weird because it. It's this uh, this weird inflection point that I've always found where, like, the idea of Yu-Gi-Oh! is much more glamorous than the reality of it. And that's literally, like, the idea of playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, so, like, it sounds cool, right? Mm-hmm. We're walking around Battle City. I can come up. I can challenge you. And, like, we'll have this duel. But, like, if you... Think about how that might actually play out. Mm-hmm. It's like you walk up to somebody. You challenge them. They win the coin flip, they do a 10-minute turn, and you're, like, logged into an MMO for this. Yeah. Like, watching them kind of combo off. You know, like, last night, I was on Master Duel, and I played against a Snake Eye TG deck. Good times. Yeah, it was nothing but fun. They won the dice roll, they called by the grave on, like, my hand trap or whatever, and they just comboed. And, it, and I was like, okay, is this over? No, and it was still not over. And, like, they just it went for so long, and they made this huge board, and it's like, and I lost. Like, would you really want to kind of do that in an MMO world? Because uh, yeah, in an MMORPG, if you put in that, like, you should have to specifically like queue up for the type of content that you can run for fifteen plus minutes and then ultimately fail. That should be something you have to opt into, not a regular part of your gameplay. If you yeah. put in fifteen minutes in an MMORPG, that that like that should be gaining you mandatory amounts of experience and pushing you further towards your goals. Now, I do think you could have a Yu Gi Oh like experience in an MMORPG, thinking something on the lines of how they played in the uh, Millennium World arc, where you had your like Ka spirit, maybe. You only have one monster, and the cards you sling are spells and traps it to like support that. Make your right. monster bigger, yeah. make their monster weaker. Some type of Yu Gi Oh like thing. It would have to be something like that. Like I think, and you know that is interesting that we are by default we assumed it would mean like you challenge them to a game of modern day Yu Gi Oh, and it could in fact be like a fighting game. It could be like a turn based RPG. Like there's mm-hmm. so many other interpretations of it with just some of the more iconic Yu Gi Oh monsters. And I think that you're right. That would actually now that I'm considering it, would work 
really a lot better. It could be it could be very interesting because of how many cards and mon- and like monsters and characters we have in Yu Gi Oh. You can make entire worlds based around. Uh, the noble knights realm, the whatever this sci-fi world that these like newer archetypes are a part of, yeah. the you can they you can go, into go the brains, go into the brains. You can, monsters. you know, I think there's a there's re- like you can go to zombie world. That, there's really a lot of content that Yu Gi Oh has made that you can repurpose into something like that. Yeah, specifically because they've got like those little anime clips or whatever that they've been showing where it's like a minute long little animation. It feels like they've got worlds there that can be explored. Mm-hmm. So, I would like an MMO. One last question about it. How much would you pay? Would you be willing to like pay a monthly fee for something like this? For, so if, from what I, for what I'm describing, sure. I mean, but I'm a Final Fantasy fourteen player. I'm used to playing monthly subscriptions and not playing games. Why is scooping frowned upon in Yu-Gi-Oh is our final question. So this person, you know, because I remember when I added this question to the pot, they were saying, um, you know, what's wrong with the idea of like giving up if you know that like your opponents kind of got everything or whatever. But like some people frown on the idea of scooping. So yay, nay. Like do you scoop or do you kind of play it out? Um, And what ought people do? The idea of accepting defeat, De- like that defeatist, it creates this defeatist mentality for a lot of players where they st- like maybe you, maybe you're actually right. Maybe you cannot win. This is an unwinnable situation, and scooping would save both you and your opponent some time. Sure, but what I've noticed for a lot of Yu Gi Oh players, they get into the habit of scooping, and to the point where they they're scooping at the first sign. Of oh I can't win this, and then after they're done scooping, they looking they're looking at their cards and they're like oh I had a play, but you get into this mo this like player scoop player scoop like your pun your opponent's turn finishes, now you're in this knee jerk situation do I play or do I scoop, and people are just if it if it looks even just a little too bad I'm just gonna scoop I'm not gonna try and play this out, you know, us this is also assuming your opponent's gonna play perfectly right. Yeah, you, that's how you feel about that's it. That's how I feel about it. Well, you'll be happy to know that I agree. <laughs> um, I I know this podcast is kind of winding down a little bit, and maybe you were thinking you'd get to go here in a couple minutes, but I've got a rant. If I turn off the the the, <laughs> the road that caster, we're Listen, done. I've, I've got a rant about this topic. <laughs> so. As resident Master Duel player who logs in and plays, on average, something like, you know, 12, 15 games a day. That's light say. work. Yeah, on like the average day. Sometimes more, sometimes less. I think that scooping is just, you, it is fine to scoop when you have, when it has been proven that you will lose. But I think right up until that moment, you should not scoop games. And it really upsets me to see so many people do it for the precise reasons you just mentioned. I think that a lot of players get into the habit of scooping fast Mm -hmm. and it begins to color their impressions of their skills, their opponent's skills, their decks, their opponent's decks, and the state of the game in general in an unhealthy way. You begin to see games as, it was unwinnable, I couldn't have won, or... Well, if they play this, my deck auto loses. My deck auto loses to any disruption. I hate the it phrase auto loses auto-lose. to any hand trap. Uh, you know, I can't beat Max C. It's a one card. It just wins. It's so sacky. And it's interesting because I think for a lot of those players, they if they would just keep playing through games, play try to play through those interruptions. Try to like stick it out. Even if you bricked, pass your turn. Just pass your turn and like let make the opponent beat you. Mm-hmm. I get so tired of people like I've you know queued up on Master Duel and people just quit immediately, which I assume to be oh they had like a, a dead hand. Or sometimes they'll scoop because I activate Maxi and they just like scoop on the spot. I've had people scoop because I like normal summon Vanquish Soul Rosin. Or normal summon like an Exos like it's just like some matchup that I guess they don't want to face. And people will scoop so fast. And it's just like don't do that. Because here's the thing, right? Like even if your opponent maxied you it doesn't mean their hand is good. It doesn't mean that they can play next turn. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean they've beaten you on the spot. Stop like telling yourself that that's the end of it all, and you might as well just give up now, abandon all hope, lie down, and rot. 
because it's just not the case. Like I've had so many games where I've drawn a bricky dead hand. They've max seed me. I've been like, good. I couldn't do shit anyway. And then I pass my turn and then come to find out they didn't even actually have a playable card. They were praying that maxi would work. And then they like bricked and they can't play. And now they pass to me and I draw a starter card and I play and it's, it's good. And even if it looks, you know, hopeless, like they went first and made an unbreakable board, try to play through it. Even if it looks like you can't, I say try to do it because like you would be shocked, 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 shocked by how many players like will just negate the first thing that happens yeah. right like and so you can bait people easily or the, you'll be surprised at what people will let you get away with without baiting it's like, moments like those where you know what everyone should want to prove is who's the better duelist mm-hmm. if you are actually better than your opponent it doesn't matter if they built a crazy board if you're better you can play around yeah it. you can play around it or even just you can Play like normal, and they might screw up and give you the win there. Yeah. Like, there's so many things that can happen, and I think too many players are just sort of, like, overwhelmed by the this, um, what is the word I'm looking for? This very polarized kind of just binary view on how a game will play out. And I think that's where you end up with these people who kind of, I want every deck to have all of its cards banned because it beat me. And it's so unfortunate and so annoying, and it pissed me off. Or Max C should be banned, and then once Max C is banned, Shifter should be banned, then ban Droll because it stopped me, and this and that. Or, like, ban, just ban it all. I get it. I know Yu-Gi-Oh! like these days is a lot, and I hate the 10-minute turns too, but I think that, like, if you just scoop and, like, let them get that freebie win, mm-hmm. you're doing yourself a disservice. I mean, and that's not. I've like, played against you many times, and I've played many decks where they should have had an advantage. I go first, I build a board, it should beat you, then you pick it apart, and I lose. This happened enough times to me where I know that, um, you know, your deck can be as strong as you want it to be if you yourself are not up to the task of yeah. piloting that deck at to its highest levels. You will still doing- win. I mean, you'll still lose when you should have won. And the thing is, in Mass Duel, it's a best of one. Your opponent is not any... They're not in any better of a situation than you other than the fact that they went first. Go ahead and make them prove they know how to use those cards. Yeah, now let me add in the two addendums to this that I know are being yelled at me in the live chat right now. Paul, what about this situation? I know they're saying this. We don't care about your situation. Well, I do. I've addre- I'll address it because okay. I've lived it. I know exactly what the two things people are saying are. The first one is that time is a factor in real-life TCG tournaments, mm-hmm. and they're correct. There, there are situations where, like, if you're in game two... And like time's kind of ticking, you got to go to game three. There is very much a thing as like a strategic like yeah. scooping. That's its own situation. I've done it. Yeah, I think that you definitely you know should consider whether or not that's a thing. So totally acknowledging that, that's fine. My thing is more like you know scooping when you're playing practice friendlies, you know stuff yeah. like that. Like yeah. So obviously there are times when like you should scoop for the sake of time. So you can start game three quickly and maybe have the no. advantage there. Start good. I said, I just, I just still think it's more important to build up a habit of being stubborn about losing games. Yeah, I'm gonna get to that actually. Okay, I'm gonna get to that. The second one is um, that people are probably saying is, well, you can scoop for data's sake. So basically, like if your opponent went first, made an unbreakable board or what feels like an unbreakable board, and you feel that you are not gonna be able to like come back from it. And it's like game one, there is some real merit in scooping then and there, so they don't actually get to see any of your strategy Mm -hmm. going into game two. You can side deck against them. They don't know what you're playing. That is also a very real and valid thing. So those are two situations where scooping can make perfect sense in a tournament setting, and it's good. Now I want to get back to the thing that you said. And here's where it all comes full circle. Be stubborn about losing. Mm Mm-hmm. It's not that scooping is bad. It's that you only scoop when you are absolutely, positively, 100% certain that you cannot win that situation. And you can only really earn that confidence by being very stubborn about not giving up when you're in those playtesting games, in those practice games, you know, in the bowels of Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel. Like, really steal yourself as the type of player that does not just give games up. And does not just assume loss at the first sight of like anything that you know could stop you. Most players think about what's the very worst play their 
opponent can make that will hurt your deck and your strategy. And that's why you think you'll lose. I think it's better to think about, well, what are all the mistakes my opponent can make? Let me make sure they exhaust all their opportunities to mess up first. Yeah, it's kind of terrifying. What you described is like actually how my brain like works in Master Duel. I always think of like, hmm. If they were to mess this up, what would it let me do? If they were to mess this up, like, what would it let me do? If they chose to negate this instead of that, then I could actually do... You know, that's how I like to think about Yu-Gi-Oh! and Master and stuff. And you'd be so surprised how many people walk right in. Mm -hmm. People will make those exact mistakes. That's why I always say, like, make your opponent... Put the onus on them to, like, earn that win. Don't, you know, give it to them. One last little anecdotal example from a time in Yu-Gi-Oh!'s past that came up a lot is uh, some of you new kids might not even know about this card. Gaga Ga Cowboy. Oh, Cowboy. The Xyz monster that came out in like 20, uh, 12, 13. Good old like Cowboy that. for game. Yeah, you can detach a material from it and deal like 800 damage to your opponent. So a common play would be like, you know, you attack your opponent with all your stuff, and they're at like 700 life points, and then you make Gaga Ga Cowboy detach, deal 800, and burn them in main phase two, and that's it. So Cowboy for game became this really big like thing, right? Like, yep. oh, you saw, oh, Cowboy for game, whatever. There would be times when people would lose games because their opponent got them to like 500 life points and said, okay, cowboy for game. And they'd be like, oh, fine, and scoop and smile and pick up their cards and be. And they didn't even have Gaga Cowboy in their extra deck. Crazy. Their opponent didn't even have Gaga Cowboy in their extra deck. Or maybe they didn't actually even have two level four monsters. Maybe one of the monsters' levels had changed earlier in the turn. Or maybe they'd use Gaga Cowboy actually earlier in the game and you forgot because you're just so used to the idea. That cowboy for game just means you lose here. Make them summon Gaga Ga Cowboy. Make them activate the effect yep. and detach the material, and then like erase the 800 life points from it. Because it doesn't matter if like you'd win or lose. It's just make them do the thing. Make your opponent earn the win like completely. That actually reminds me of a quick anecdote about it. I was playing a commander game. And my opponent did some infinite combo. And I'm look, I don't like to lose. I'm stubborn about things. He's like, so yeah, I'm just going to do this uh, X amount of times and I win. It's like, uh, I might have a response. I'm going to need to see you do it. I'm, I, I said, and he's like, are you sure? Yeah, I'm, I want to like, just, just, go, just, just go ahead, do enough to kill me. And we went, when we went through every iteration of his combo, even when he can loop it, I made him do every last piece just to see if he'd give me an opportunity. Yeah, because you never quite know. And I think that it's just... I still lost. <laughs> yeah. And, and, that, and that's like the little extra like thing here is it's not that you won't, like the doing this means you won't lose. It's that you're like keeping your opponent honest and like taking that opportunity to see opportunities where you could win. Because you literally lose 100% of the duels that you scoop, yep. but like you might win like 10% of those ones that you kind of stick around in. And that might be the difference between topping and not. It might be, and it might be the difference between recognizing in a future game, months from now, if you'd be able to win or lose in the situation that another person would give up in. Yep. Because if you've beaten it once before in practice, you know you can do it in competition. Yeah, and you know, like, not to sound too anime or anything, but like, if you show me something twice in this game, I remember like situations, like a little niche things that beat me. I'm like, okay, I'm never losing to that again. I gotta tell you guys, so. he watched Mashal not long ago, and Mash said something to the same effect. Not they say it in like every shonen. Yeah, but Mash said it, yeah, and, Mash I, said and deep true. down, you want to be Mash burned dead. So. Yeah, I mean, it's just a, a good thing to do in Yu-Gi-Oh! is try not to give up too easily. If you're giving up, make sure you have very good reason to do so. Mm -hmm. Not just because it, oh, I bricked, or they use one card I don't like. Okay, uh, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Be greedy about uh, winning, guys. Just be greedy yes. about it. Stay greedy. That's a good uh, way to top off the pot of greed, huh? Hopefully you guys enjoyed this week's podcast. It was a lot of fun. Um, make sure that you, as always, leave those questions down in the submission. And also, leave positive reviews no matter where you listen to this podcast. We'll read them out on, on air. Yeah, we will read them. And if you, of course, have any other feedback, suggestions, improvements um, that we, you think we can make the pod, I'm always open for them. So We'll see you guys in the next one. Pass, Pass turn. turn.